Hey, YouTube, this is Praxis Prepper. They say that revenge is a dish best served cold, and I say, why not just take that to the next level and serve it as a delicious frozen dairy-based dessert? Revenge is an interesting... I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Not waiting, better believe in your mind, because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. All right, well, if you are watching this later on, you missed an awful lot of excitement because we uh, did about 15 minutes of live stream and there was no audio. I believe that you guys can hear me now. I'm going to wait a moment to see some people start popping in here. And I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, so um, whenever you have kind of a one-man show and they need to do a bunch of different things, and uh, sometimes things get missed and occasionally that thing that gets missed is just dragging a slider for a microphone from zero up to a normal level and that's actually a really really good lesson that i learned and i have learned that so many times in the past but it's it's always a good reminder lists are really important we're going to be talking a lot in this video about the importance of lists when your life depends on it because this video is all about uh doing a test run of what it would be like having to be in the shelter is everything going to work and one big thing that we have uh, to get us in here are go lists we have all these lists of things that we need to do before we head in and um we're going to be going over uh, all those later uh, about all the important things that we have to do. I know that not everything that I have to do is necessarily uh, applicable to you guys, but it might get your brain kind of uh, churning about like, oh man, that is something I should consider if I were going to X, Y, or Z. So um, I'm just going to re rehash everything that I did in the, the, the silent version of the live stream earlier on. So what we uh, started off is uh, just kind of saying what this uh, whole experience is going to be. Essentially what I want to do is I want to test out all the critical systems that are necessary for keeping us alive. Uh, those are the really important tests that we want to do. And those involve things like making sure we have water, making sure that we have air that we can breathe. Those are absolutely critical. And if we don't have those things, we're going to die. Uh, the other things that we want to check on are things that will add to our happiness. Now, we're going to be doing some tests about things like that. Uh, those are lesser priority. And if the, some things that are like difficult to test, we're not going to do a test on those if it just you know involves our happiness. One thing in particular is the temperature in here. This structure was built as a root cellar. I built it several years ago when we were building the house. I like the idea of having a root cellar because you'd be able to, you know, have a free refrigerator. If the grid ever went down, you can store things over the winter in your, uh, your root cellar. And um, that is a really exciting concept to me. And I'm really glad that I built it because when I built it, I built it with a couple of modifications so that I knew that I could always turn it into a fallout shelter if I needed to. I didn't think I'd be doing it within two years, but here we are. So, uh, we're going to be uh, running through this whole test to make sure that this uh, root cellar has effectively been turned into a fallout shelter. Already, I've uh, got a note on uh, one mistake that I made, and that is the internet connection. The internet connection was not going to work. If it, today had been go day and we had gone with the original plan, I found out that this router that I have here, this thing here, it wasn't working. Uh, I had to go into the house and I got the router from the house. So we're, we're broadcasting using the router from the house. So I'm, I'm going to be taking a list for myself uh, while we uh, are going through this about things that I need to uh, you know, address myself. I'm going to be looking forward to your questions. Amber, I think, have you agreed to, huh? have you agreed to re read them? Are you cool with that? Yeah. Okay, so Amber is cool with Somebody's reading. praising me because I actually saved the live stream, apparently. Amber did save the live stream. Uh, I mean, there's so many little details. Yes, super chat. Oh, and, and Stuart Lonan, thank you very much. The second, uh, second super chat of the day. I guess the first super chat was for the video and the second super chat's for the audio. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, first things first. What we need to do is we need to talk about the air quality that we have in here right now. Like I said, this was built as a root cellar. It just shut up. There's not people in here except for right now a bunch of us dumbasses and let me tell you about the air quality that we have in here right now um could you get me that air things uh monitor over there a little white circle um i have a monitor that i use for the air quality in our house it's this right here it's called air things if you want to get one of these i have a link down in the description below maybe i do maybe i don't i had it in the first live stream i'll be adding it later if it's not here um i'm just curious i don't want to do the whole live stream yeah it looks like it looks like it might still be there. Okay, I'm just going to confirm. Okay, yes, it's, it's still actually there. All right, so um, 
So I've got I've got uh, links to some of the things that I'm using uh, in there. As you can see, it's 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 coming up red right there. And the reason it's coming up red is because this is not a living environment. It was never made to be a living environment, really. And uh, here here are the uh, uh, the air quality measurements we're starting with. And this is good. It's good to start bad. Uh, are this you actually getting it in frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty much in frame. <laughs> I'm not going to screw everything up, just the audio. Um, okay, so this is uh, this is radon. This is an important one. I mean, it's not an important one for the fact that we're in here for a little bit. Uh, it's radiation, you know, and radiation is time, uh, you know, the duration of the exposure and everything. This is our normal um, exposure uh, we have in the house. It's like below two most of the time, and that's considered safe. Uh, and uh, we're up to like 14 in here. We have uh, 14... Uh, PC. I don't, I'm not sure what the unit of measurement in for, is for radon, but it's high. It's too high in here. We're breathing in radioactive gases right now. Mm. Mm. So we want to we uh, uh, correct that. We've got CO2 here, and uh, you can see the normal CO2 levels in our house, up and down, up and down. We're starting to go up into the yellow and red just by having been in here for, uh, I guess, the past 20 minutes or so. So CO2 levels are already starting to elevate. Not dangerous yet, but they'll get there. We got humidity levels in here. That's not of that much interest. I and mean, it's usually around just a little over 50 in the house. And we've kicked up to about 70 in here. We've got temperature, a notable difference there. Normally we're like, you know, kind of Jimmy Carter warm, you know, 68 degrees, somewhere around there in the house. Sometimes we kick it up with the uh, the wood stove. But you, you see uh, this, this drop down here. We're at 44 degrees in here. That's livable. We could live at 44 degrees if we had to. Not comfortable, but we could do it. Uh, you know, if we have the, the you know the proper clothing and stuff. Uh, here are VOCs, volatile organic compounds. That really shot up. You can see, like normal in the house, and then shooting up. So that's something we want to uh, deal with. I'm not sure exactly where those are coming from. The um, the meter was next to a bag of onions. I, I imagine onions probably emit VOCs, and then it also does barometric pressure, but that is not of all of interest to us. So we're in here. We are sealed up. We are ready to go, and Amber's going to take some of your questions, and what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, start prepping this space, because what you see behind me is uh, these are racks that we can put food on for a fallout shelter, but as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that's not food on there, and these ultimately are bed racks, they're bunks, so we want to get these cleared off so that we could use them, and well, I'll talk about this while Amber kind of reads your questions, comments, concerns, criticisms. Nasty, bigoted uh, remarks, and um, and I'm going to be clearing this stuff off. What we have on here is, uh, the reason I'm doing it is because this stuff is heavy. Uh, these are five-gallon jugs of water. Uh, each one of these is water plus uh, chlorine uh, bleach. Uh, I added all these in the off chance that we aren't able to add fresh water when we come in. Uh, fresh water is one of the things that we have on our list. Again, like I said, I'm going to be going over all these lists. It's Amber's job when we come in here to top off some of these so we have some nice fresh water. But let's say there's an EMP pulse, the electricity goes out. Let's just say Amber like pulls a praxis and she forgets something, and <laughs> like with the audio, except like instead of no audio, it's no water. One of those is irritating, the other one's kind of a life-threatening situation. So I wanted to have make sure that we at least have some water. It, you know, it tastes like chlorine bleach. Uh, you know, I've got filters for it and stuff. We've got the Berkey in here, uh, you know, so we can uh, just run stuff through that. Uh, but these are all pre-filled, uh, pre ready to go, and they're also going to be used as radiation shielding in the entryway. So I'm going to start moving these, and Amber can get your questions. Ah, here we go. Do we get any questions yet? Uh, let's see. Somebody said, if we get separated, I'm following Amber. <laughs> uh, well, they'll... That'll solve their audio issues, but I, I don't know if it'll solve their water issues. That's all I can say. People are complimenting my hat. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad we're keeping it relevant. <laughs> you should tell them what the hat's from. Uh, I don't remember. Oh, okay. I'm glad it meant so much to you. Well, it's some anime thing, right? Huh? It's some anime cartoon, isn't it? Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking all of these jugs and... There's a question. Oh, question, okay. Um, I'm making a wall over there. The water will help to block radiation. We'll talk more about that later if someone reminds me. 
uh, because many of you might have a concern that we can't drink the water if we use it as a radiation block. Not true. And I'll explain why later. What's the question? The question is, what's the first meal going to be? Um, the first supper or the last supper? What? First supper. Um, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about it. You keep some spontaneity. Um, what I am going to be going through all the food that we have here. Uh, I think uh, many of you guys who've watched any of the full tours probably already have a sense of what we have in here. I, I don't really have a meal menu worked out. Um, and that might sound like that's like a real um, potential problem that like, you know, well, what if you run out of food? Well, uh, one thing I advocate for constantly on my channel is if you're ever going to bug out, you can't have a better um, practice run for bugging out than doing camping because camping is kind of like bugging out. You, you know, you head off to the woods, you take everything with you. I go camping all the time and I've got a pretty good sense of how much food is required for like, you know, like a week or something like that. And whereas we're aiming for, you know, a couple of weeks in here, uh, I've got a good sense of how much food we would need and we've got gross overkill on it. So I haven't really worked out a meal plan. We just tried to keep things balanced and have lots of options and lots of options, you know, just for variety. You don't want to just be like rice and beans. If you had rice, beans and bullets, you, would you know, eat the first two and then you'd be like looking to put the other one in your head at some point because you'd just be going crazy. More questions more. rolling in. Okay, more questions. Uh, let's see. Two of them are sort of related, I guess, but... Uh... Not trying to be rude, but how do you deal with the air quality if someone passes gas? And then another person was asking, uh, have you guys figured out the waste disposal yet? Yep, we're going to be talking about that. Um, well, why don't we jump into it right now? Okay. Um, obviously, shit happens, and you need to be prepared for that. In terms of people farting, I just suck it up, I guess. Um, <laughs> oh, that reminds me. We should be imp starting to people, improve the air. People are wondering about air circulation, I guess. Yeah, let's let's start improving the air, because we're actually poisoning ourselves with radon right now. Oh. Can you slide over? And I'm, I'm going to turn the fan on right now. Actually, that's the, I mean, it's the whole time, reason we're in here. We're not just, like, chit-chatting with people. This is about, like, actually getting things solved. All right, so uh, I am unplugging the dehumidifier, ah. and I'm putting in the fan. Oh, and I am realizing that we've got a little bit of an issue here. What's wrong? Well, I, uh, it's not a huge issue. It's just um, I have to unscrew something and the table's in the way. Oh. And my boy's in the way, my toolbox. One thing that I thought was important to have in here uh, was a toolbox so that if something came up, I could actually address it. So I made a little box of tools and I'm going to use them to solve this particular issue. The way that we're getting air in here is we are... Don't unplug the sound. <laughs> Did I? Did I? No. Okay, no. okay cool. Um, the way we're getting air in here is there's a small vent that uh, shares the same... Uh, it shares the same air intake as the rest of the house. So in order to make sure that the house isn't sucking air from here, which, uh, you know, we've established would be horrible because of all the radon in here. Uh, Somebody's asking, uh, how is the radon raising right now? Normally below two, but how does it rise? Are you uh, pretending for this practice? Um, well, you know, uh, the radon, I, I'm not concerned about the radon because we're going to be bringing in fresh air and radon's not going to be able to keep up with it, I don't think. The, the, the air intake is really just to give us, uh, you know, fresh oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide air. The, it, it took years for that radon to build up in here. Radon's heavier than air. It kind of pools down in low places. I'm not really that concerned about it. And honestly, even if we had, let me turn that, that's going to be irritating. Let me turn that down. That's the fan at full power. Here we go. Let's bring it down to that. All right. Uh, yeah, even if we had the radon at that incredibly high level for the entire two weeks, um, I don't. I don't think it'll be that big of a deal, and it's definitely going to be safer than being outside. So um, I'm not really concerned about the radon. Um, people are wondering about uh, water being a barrier against radiation. Some people think it's good, and then one person is saying, uh, "I thought." water was a poor radiation barrier you needed something like 50 feet of water to actually slow it down yeah okay let's address that right now okay so there are two concerns that people have with uh 
uh, with the water. One is if you use it as a radiation barrier, does it make it so if you try to drink the water, you're getting radiation? That is not true. If you get radioactive particles, dust, things like that, in the water, and then you drink that, the water isn't radioactive, the dust particles are, and if those get into you, that's terrible. You don't want to do that. But if you have a sealed container of water and it is being irradiated, that's not changing any of the nature of the water or anything like that. The water is still going to be fine to drink. So that's number one. I just want to uh, mention that because I know that's a concern that a lot of people have. So uh, the other uh, concern is that the water is not a particularly good barrier. No, it's not a particularly good barrier. But I've got a bunch of water here, and it's in my freaking way, <laughs> and I want to put it somewhere. The best place to put it is a place where I'm not going to be hanging out. And one place that I'm not going to be hanging out is right next to the front door to this place because the front door to this place is three quarters inch of, three quarter inches of wood and like about an inch of foam. That's, that's the barrier. So the, the front door is no barrier at all. The only reason that we are safe in here is because there's a 90 degree angle uh, uh, when you come in. I, I think I, I've talked about that in a couple of the, uh, the videos uh, you know, where I do a full tour, where you come in and then you do a 90 degree uh, bend before you come into the shelter. So all the radiation is going straight through the door and hitting the back wall over here. And the radiation doesn't fly through the air and then spontaneously just like, take a, uh, a bang to the left or anything like that. So uh, all the radiation is just hitting that back wall. So the reason I'm putting the water over there is, A, just to get it out of my way because I, I need a place to put it. I know putting it over there, I'm not damaging the water in any way. It's still going to be safe to drink. And the other reason is because even though water is not the best uh, barrier, it's better than air. And there's you know nothing over there. So adding the water adds some kind of barrier so there's a little bit less coming in. So if people like happen to like accidentally put their arm over there, there's that much less radiation coming in. It's not about making it perfect, it's not about bringing it down to zero per se, but just trying to make it better than it is. And since I, I got nowhere else to put them, that's why I'm putting them over there. But they will offer some kind of uh, protection. You know, water's not a terrible barrier. It's just not as good as like dirt and rock and all that kind of stuff. Okay, in terms of uh, safety, we talked about the radiation, but somebody is asking, what do you do about the marauders trying to get into your bunker with you three in it? Okay. Um, I touch on this a little bit in a video that I'm going to share with you guys in a little. Uh, in a little. Uh, remember I mentioned those lists, in case you, if you need help visualizing what a list looks like here, I don't want to have to keep holding up, everyone knows what a list is. Um, I, I have a video where I go over me uh, running through uh, my list, and uh, you know, Amber's got a list of things to do, River's got a list of things to do, uh, and they're all, they're all pretty important, so it's important that people practice it, and we have practiced it. Um, one of the items on my list is to get personal protective devices and uh, bring them into this space. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't get into the particulars of all that. If you guys watch my channel for any amount of time, you know that I kind of conspicuously just uh, don't tend to mention about security or anything like that. Um, and the reason for that isn't because I don't think it's important. It's just sort of because I think it's kind of stupid to go talking about it online because you'd be like showing your entire hand to people. So unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable talking about all the specifics uh, for that. But if you can brainstorm uh, yourself about what some of those issues are and you know what sorts of approaches somebody's, you might want to take. Somebody's saying that you're rambling a little bit. And there's lots of questions that still need to be answered. I know. You're, you're right. You're, you're, <laughs> you really are right. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll try to keep it more succinct. I, you guys know my channel, you know that I have trouble with that. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I, we, we have guns, but I don't, I don't tend to talk about them much. Okay. Let me up with another question. I'm going to keep moving jugs. So, in, related to the waste disposal issue, there's, you know, odor, maybe we can deal with it, but uh, there's going to be an issue with uh, bacteria, whatever. What are we going to do with that? That stuff shouldn't be lingering in our shelter. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a plan. Can you uh, maybe slide to the side? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a plan for the waste disposal. I'm going to do a demo of that in a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about it right now. Um, actually, I'll get the unit. Okay, so this is what we've got. And we've used this before. This is a uh, five-gallon bucket. And yeah, maybe you slide over even a little bit more. Okay. Five-gallon bucket, and you can get these uh, little uh, toilet seats. It's just a toilet seat that like clips onto the top. I, I don't know why these are even made. I mean, under what circumstances? I, I guess people that go fishing and stuff like that might use them. Like they go out on the ice or 
something like that. I don't know. I mean, if you're, if you're I've seen people use this for camping. I guess, but just poop in the woods. That's a big thing. I don't know. <laughs> so, so people like having an actual toilet seat to sit on. Yeah, well, I don't and know. if you if you have a female body, it's kind of hard to you know pee or whatever standing up. Okay, well, I'm glad you're advocating for that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, well, I'm one of the people that bought one of these, and that's what we're going to be using. What we will do is we've got bags that, uh, that line in here, and I, you, know, you guys can visualize a bag. I bought a bunch of bags that fit inside of five-gallon buckets. We have twist ties also. We'll put a bag in. Your people will do their business in here, and uh, at that point, it gets closed up. The twist tie goes around it, and that bag never has to get opened again. Uh, I, I was pretty particular about that. I didn't want to have like it be like, oh, it sits in there for a while and then someone else needs to use it or like one bag a day. No, we've got like multiple bags so everybody could crap twice for every single day for 14 days and we would not run out of bags. Somebody's wondering about issues with like uh, airborne bacteria that might come from that. Well, I don't think that it'd be that big. A, it, you can't infect yourself with something you already have. <laughs> so, um... And plus, we're really, we're sealing the things up, and, um, you know, th that's the way we're going, uh, we're trying it. Um, we, we're going to be doing a test with that, and we've got two ways of doing the test. One is, if someone here happens to have a number two ready to go, uh, we're going to do the test that way. If that doesn't happen, the chickens were uh, very generous to <laughs> supply this incredibly strong-smelling uh, pile of crap from their... Uh, from their coop and we're going to be uh, putting that in there and we'll really let it kind of uh, fill up the air in here <laughs> and, and we'll see how quickly we can uh, vent that out of here but I mean you know if it doesn't work we want to find that out during the test as opposed to like when uh, there's a, a real reason not to go outside so th th that's what we're going to be doing uh, during the test phase I, I want to get all this stuff off before I start demoing stuff though does bacteria go through plastic somebody's suggesting it does I you know it's, it's above my pay, pay grade. Oh. Um, I think given enough time, anything's possible. Uh, there are a few people asking about uh, what are we going to do for like uh, entertainment or exercise programs and things like that. Okay, okay, that's a good question. Uh, for entertainment, we uh, have computers, we have um, uh, books, we have... Uh, but let's be visual here. River, could you be somewhere that's not there? I, just, I, I keep having to get into this area. Maybe move the chair? Yeah, like just maybe back over there. Here we go. Let's show everything we've got. Television's a visual medium. <laughs> All right, so we've got uh, lots of games. we got checkers. There's some Sudoku in here. I've never played Sudoku, but they were kicking around, and I figured, what a great place to store them. I, that, I found that this has been a really great place to store crap that I don't really have any other use for, that it's like, I'd only want to look at that if it was the end of the world. So this is like a great place to put it. Playing cards. This is, oh, what a, what an interesting game. <laughs> Bug Out by Praxis Prepper. That's interesting. There's probably a link in the description below if you want to get your own copy of that. So we got that in here, Mancala. Lots of uh, games, uh, but we've got some other stuff too. We've got another box with a lot of different uh, items in it. Here it is. This is, the, this is the box I was looking for initially. And everything's labeled uh, as to what's in it. And this one... Oh, crap. Yeah, it's like all you know, crafts of this uh, notebooks for like just sketching or, or 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 writing things. There's like line notebooks in here. Um, we've got crayons, and you know, to be honest, uh, that's not just for River. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of crayons as well. Pens and pencils, and markers, a pencil sharpener. That's a good idea. I mean, you can do it with a, uh, with a knife, but this is going to be a lot neater uh, when you're in here. A pair of scissors. You know, so all the different types of things just to kind of, you know, occupy yourself, keep yourself entertained. Uh, and we also have books, and I'm going to show you some of the, the books. Yeah, you're getting cold. Yeah. I want to get a blanket to go back and get a blanket. You want to go get a blanket? Yeah. Oh, River. Um, well, we got, no, uh, no, no, it, well, we got blankets here. We got blankets here. Okay. All right, we, we got... Uh, this is why we're doing the test right now, is to find out how everybody feels. Now, River's feeling was that he was going to be okay um, just being barefoot, essentially. And he's finding slippers. out that that's not working. And that's good. This is what this whole test is about. Um, so he's feeling like he wants a blanket, and we got plenty. Okay. I more, brought a blanket. Uh, I brought some thick socks and some slippers, and I think I'm more comfortable if I... Uh, than if okay. I hadn't brought them. Oh, no, 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 can I just say that Somebody's asking what the current air temperature is. Uh, I'll check that in just a moment. We can't be super picky for now. Can, we, yeah. can I just give you these? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
It's two really soft blankets, okay? All right. Yeah, so what I have in the bedding bin is I've got uh, three pillows. I've got, uh, I think, three uh, or six sheets for everyone for top and bottom. I've got lots of little throw blankets. I've got large blankets. And in addition to this, what we're going to be doing is bringing in all of my camping stuff. I've got camping stuff in the shed. And one of my last trips on my list is uh, to go, go and grab all the camping stuff. So we just have gross overkill. We've got sleeping bags. We've got all these different things. We want to have way too much because we do have extra room in here. We can we can spare some of it. Okay, over your head, Amber. Well, all right. What are we going to do about, like, uh, somebody asked about, like, an exercise program. So, we're, you know, basically we're not just atrophying in here. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I can't speak to anyone else, but uh, what I plan on doing uh, actually gets highlighted in this video uh, where we're uh, getting ready uh, for this, uh, um, you know, packing up, is I've got an exercise program on the Nintendo Switch, and I plan on bringing that in, and that's what I do every other day. In fact, today is supposed to be on my exercise day, but I had to skip because we're doing, we're doing all this stuff today. But uh, that's what I plan on doing. You can do it in a very small environment. It has, like, a... Uh, it's uh, it's Ring Fit Adventure, if oh, any yeah. of you are familiar with that. That's a good way of describing it by using its actual name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, it uses these compression rings uh, to kind of, you kind of squeeze and you pull them and everything. I honestly kind of bought it for Amber and River. I thought that they'd enjoy it, and I'm the only one that plays it right now. <laughs> and I, I absolutely love it. It's the best exercise program that I've ever done because it hits all the little muscles that you usually like. Well, if you're a guy anyway, it hits all the muscles that you kind of like skip because, like, for guys, it's like all we exercise is like our biceps <laughs> or whatever, and um, yeah, it, it kind of does everything else around your back. And I, I found it to be really helpful, so I plan on bringing that in, and um, that's my plan anyway. River will explain it as well. All right, um, uh, no somebody was asking about where was it? Uh, homework, schoolwork, that kind of thing. Would we bring in any of uh, River's stuff so he can continue to do his education? That's, um, a, that's a good question. Yeah. I personally, I actually already graduated from college, so I, I don't have to worry about that. But uh, it might be good for, you know, my brother to uh, be continuing with his education. Well, my feeling on that is, you know, when you were young and it was, well, we had a bunch of snow this morning. Like, it, school would have been canceled today, uh, or, or yesterday anyway, because we had a big snowstorm. And remember how you kind of, like, waited and were hoping it would be a big snowstorm so that school would be canceled? Um, I kind of feel it's the same way with nuclear holocaust, where it's like, you know, if it's a nuclear holocaust, it's like school's out for that time period. And you feel okay with that, River? <laughs> so I don't want to make anyone wish it on or anything, but uh, th that's kind of the, the, the plan. I mean, you know, just, just reading and drawing and talking, I think, uh, is probably sufficient, uh, you know, for two weeks, you know, because people are going to be uh, experiencing all sorts of other things and learning all sorts of other lessons. I don't think we need to worry too, too much about the math. Um, so, yeah, I'm just planning on taking the, the two weeks off with it and uh, make up for it later when we, you know, learn how to, like, cannibalize each other and, no cannibalizing! It'll be, a new, it'll be a new world. No! <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to continue uh, to clear this stuff out. Somebody has asked, has the temperature increased since oh, we've yes. been in here? The temperature has gone up by three degrees. Three degrees, okay. All right. Why don't we do a, uh, let's do it an air quality check. Okay. All right, so uh, this thing hooks up to my phone, and I am going to get it to refresh. Let's see, okay, it's resyncing. It takes a little bit of time. It's a little irritating. And we'll get to see where our levels are headed. In a little bit, I do want to do the, uh, the, the walkthrough of uh, heading in here, because I think that's really critical. It's really critical to uh, have your own kind of uh, action list of everything that you plan on, uh, on working on uh, before you, you head out, because you can't do everything ahead of time. Some things have to be last minute. Oh, okay. thanks for the super chat. Oh, thanks, Alicia. That's really kind of you. All right, um, so here's our update. Uh, our radon has started uh, flatlining. We, we're plateauing on radon. It is not going up anymore, so that's good. Uh, radon is not going up anymore, and CO2 is not going up anymore. Um, humidity can, actually is accelerating upwards, which is what you'd expect. Temperature is starting to tick upwards, according to this. Whew, huge change in VOC. Right there, you see that plummet down there. I'm not. That might. That might be due to the uh, the change in position. Maybe the fact that it was next to the onions 
is why it was so high and moving it over here is what brought that down. That, I'm, I'm just speculating there. So uh, we're doing okay. The, the, the things we don't want in the air are starting to level off or go down and all the things that we would expect to be going up like humidity and temperature are starting to pick up. And we'll continue to clear out this area so we can test out the bunk beds. Do we get any other questions? Um, I've got one see. more entertainment thing I want to talk about. Too. I <laughs> okay. Can't get up um, I need to get to the doorway. If the door is no great barrier, would it be of benefit to build a brick wall and earth berm in front of the door? Yes, it would. That's one thing I want to bring up in this. Actually, uh, I forget who I was talking about. It might have been Grant on here. You, uh, Grant, if you're watching, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, th there have been a lot of concerns about what we're doing in here in terms of uh, how perfect it is and, uh, it, it, you know, if everything is ideal. And that, okay. and that's one thing that I think it's really important to be very uh, open with you guys about is that what I'm doing here is not perfect. Uh, this is kind of the best that we can do, uh, you know, with the assets that we have. Uh, we're doing this test so we can improve it, but uh, you shouldn't look at what we do here and think, well, you know, whatever Praxis did, I'm going to do exactly that because that's the ideal. No, what we're doing here is kind of the best that we can do, and there, there are, are downsides with it. Our door, for example, it's not a blast door, and as luck would have it, uh, the only military installation within any kind of a distance from here, which would be like a, I don't think it'd be a primary strike target, but maybe like a secondary or tertiary strike target. Um, the door happens to face exactly in the direction of <laughs> that base. And we're, we're within like shockwave distance, potentially, depending on like what would happen over there. So what we're doing is it's not perfect, but what, uh, what we're trying to do is take a situation that is awful, that would be absolutely awful. You guys remember... Uh, perhaps you remember a couple of years ago in Hawaii when there was that uh, erroneous uh, warning that went out on the, uh, the public warning system saying that there was an ICBM coming in from North Korea and people had no plan. They had nothing and they were taking their kids and shoving them in sewers because that was like the best they could think to do. And what we're trying to do is put ourselves in the mental headspace of you know, that parent and try to think about things that we wish that we had done to make things better. You know, are we gonna make it perfect? No, I mean, the only way to make it perfect, honestly, would be to like lobotomize the entire planet and start over from scratch. <laughs> yes. Somebody uh, is still uh, expressing concern about the uh, poop situation. Like, uh, yeah. you know, it's gonna start piling up and it's not really good oh, for us okay. to be exposed to it. And also, yes, yeah. uh, somebody said, um, we should probably separate the poo and the pee because mixed together it can sort of like react. Okay. And yeah, let's just jump in on this yeah. now because everyone's thinking about the, the, the poop and the pee. I know where yeah, you guys' minds they, are. They think, well, they think you're being a little too lax. Too, I'm, I'm too it. cavalier about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, here are the saving graces about that. Yes, uh, urine and fecal material should uh, not be mixed together because uh, adding urine to fecal material takes a bad situation and makes it much worse. I used to have a composting toilet. Uh, at my previous house that I built, and um, it, it gets really gross in there. Um, and uh, the way that we're planning on, on dealing with that is that uh, you, know, you poop in the bag and you close up the bag, and so it's, it's, you know, it's only as dry and voluminous as it needs to be. And the pee is gonna go in a separate bag, and the pee is all just gonna go down the drain. We have a sink in here, uh, which I, I plumbed in, We'll, we'll delicately uh, dump it down the drain, and then we're going to you know, wash out the, the sink so that we're not splashing it around. So we're going to keep those, uh, those two very separate. And here's the thing. Um, everyone talks about, like, you want to get into your follow shelter, and you want to be in there for two weeks. That doesn't mean that you can't open the door after a couple of days or something like that. So after a couple of days, we might have a couple, well, I hope we have a couple of bags of poo in here, <laughs> otherwise we've got some other issues. Um, after a couple of days, we can very easily go up to the door, crack it open, toss the bags outside. I don't, I don't care where they land. They're just going to be out there somewhere. And we can start kind of getting stuff out of here. The way you protect yourself from radiation is three ways. You get distance, you have shielding, and you have the duration that you're exposed to it. Now, while we're in here, we have shielding, and we also have some distance because, you know, the <laughs> follow, uh, hopefully it's just going to be up on the top there. What is it? Somebody said it's best to combine the human waste into a large cistern and then load it into a drone crop duster to spray on your enemies. 
<laughs> uh, permaculture suggests you want to take waste and turn them into valuable resources for the future. So I can I can dig that. Um, but the, the third thing is is duration. So if we're like popping open the door briefly, tossing some stuff out, especially with shielding, and we're going to talk about we have some personal shielding. I'm going to be bringing down in a moment to show you guys uh, where I can shield myself up, and it would be me uh, doing this uh, for a number of reasons. One, I think I just uh, this is my crazy crackpot idea, so I think I'm the one that's responsible for executing some of these plans. Uh, the other is that um, you know I'm, you know I'm the strongest, so I can you know carry you know more stuff, do things quicker. And uh, the other reason, and, th and this is uh, one to like joke about, is that I'm the oldest. So if I get exposure to, ra to radiation, uh, I have less of a chance of it impacting me during my lifetime. You know, uh, Amber has many more years to develop cancer than I do. River has many, many more years to develop cancer than I do. So if anyone's going to put themselves in a situation where they're going to be uh, exposed to radiation, it's going to be me doing that stuff, uh, just because you know, I've got the kind of the the least potential harm that can happen to me because, uh, well, it's like with the chickens that we have. Um, I, I have this crackpot idea that I want to vent the radon from the house into the chicken coop when we build our underground chicken coop. And the concern is, well, you're going to give all your chickens lung cancer. And my response is, well, yeah, if they live to be like 50 or 60 years old, then maybe they'll get lung cancer. So if you're not going to live long enough to get the, uh, the ill effects of something, you know, uh, you're the better person to be the sacrificial lamb for that. Do we have any other questions I should jump on right now? Uh, I, I, mentioning, you know, needing to open the door or whatever, what do you have a plan for if there's like debris or whatever blocking the door? Yes, yeah, actually, I mentioned that we can lock the door from the outside and we can uh, lock the door now from the inside. Um, but I've always been a little concerned, even before we had the inside locks, that like, I mean, just because it's a paranoid person in me, that I was afraid I, I'd come in here and someone would lock me in. There's a, there's a hasp on the outside, and, and you could put like a, just a stick through it or you know, padlocks. So you could literally get locked in here. And that always kind of bothered me. Now, um, there's a great book called uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills. That's a book that we're going to be bringing in here to make sure that we have it with us just for reference material. I'd highly recommend you get a copy. You can download it for free. It's by Crescent Kearney. Can Canadian Prepper did a whole uh, video seri series on it recently. Uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills by Crescent Kearney. Just do a Google search right now and you can download a free copy of it. I'd suggest getting a paper copy just because it's, um, you know, if your computer's not working, the digital one doesn't do you much good. But in there, what are we talking about? Uh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. In there, they have a lot of plans, thank you, uh, for how to build a fallout shelter. And one of the important things they mention a lot of times is having an, an egress. So you have your main way in, and then you get some other way of getting out of there. Like, you know, like some kind of like a, a another hatch, and you just bury it in sand. So if you ever needed to, you could open the hatch, and the sand all pours in, but you could easily dig your way out. So you don't turn your, uh, you know, your shelter into a grave. Uh, I didn't go that route, uh, mostly just because uh, there were so many question marks with building codes <laughs> making this place. I didn't want any more question marks about, like, well, what's this giant, weird extra door that you're putting into this thing? Um, you know, that's kind of a downside when you're working with building codes and stuff. So I did not put an egress door, but I did put an axe in here. We have an axe so we can chop through the door if we need to get out of here. I, you know, I don't think I would chop through the door if we needed to get out of here, like, after a couple of days and we need to keep using the shelter. But ultimately, we can get out of here. Even if a tree falls against it, you know, we can chop through. I mean, I guess if giant boulders were against it, we'd maybe be a little bit screwed, but I don't think there's going to be any giant boulders. Any other questions? Otherwise, I, I want to I want to get these bumps. Uh, yeah, there's questions. several Okay, questions. we'll keep going. Okay. Um, Hit me up with it while I carry this jug. Do we have a decontamination shower in here or any other form of, you know, decontamination if we get exposed or something? Very good question. This is what we have for decon. Part of it, anyway. Do I have any tea left? You didn't bring the hot water, did you? I did. It's oh, over behind the River. Or, oh, no, great. it's next to him, I think. Okay. Yeah. We wouldn't have hot water in here unless we run our, our stoves, but... Um, I asked Amber speaking to bring of, some in. Speaking of which, there was also a question about what are we going to do for cooking. And okay, we'll get to that yeah. in just a moment. Let's talk about the decon stuff. This is a pair of coveralls, and I've got a whole heck of a lot of them. Each one of these is a trip out. Th these coveralls, uh, they do the entire body, hood up over the head, all, all the way down to your feet and everything. It covers up your entire body. What I would do if, if I needed to leave here, if I needed to go out for some reason, I do not plan on wanting to do that. But if I needed to do that, I would cover myself up in these. And on my way back, I would just take that thing off and just leave it outside. And we deal with it in two weeks. It'll just be 
like littered out there. And so what I've got, I think I said like what, like 10, that's 10 trips out. I plan on hopefully doing zero trips out and I won't need to use any of those. But those would make it so if I get anything on me, it all completely stays outside because yeah, if you're bringing in particles, that's a problem. I'm gonna show you guys the other things I have for shielding, which is pretty important. Mm. All right. How are we doing in terms of uh, levels? Yeah, you want to check? Uh, do you know how to check it? Uh, let's see. CO2 average is 697 ppm. Oh, we, we, you have to, we have to do a uh, another sync and update. Oh, okay. All right. So this is what we've got for for shielding. Now this isn't much, but it's something. Right. What are you going to do about decontamination for a friend or family member that shows up after the fallout has started? I don't have plans for that, to be honest. I, don't, I guess it's like get naked and come inside. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's going to take a little while. All right, so this is what we have for our uh, shielding. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you would put on you when you get an x-ray. Uh, like, you know, the dentist's office. This is front and back, and we also have pieces for covering the head, and I've, I've, I've got a skirt, and the skirt kind of goes down around your legs, and in addition to this, I'm just going to toss this, this stuff back away. What would we do if we happen to have a guest over at the house while the, you know, the fallout event is happening? <laughs> we don't have guests, do we? Uh, I guess normally we don't have yeah, guests. Yeah, normally we don't have guests over the house. We usually just meet people at other places. Yeah. Well, that's a good point, though. I, I, I mean, you know, you know, these questions are getting at something that really goes down a rabbit hole about, like, how many people can you help? And, uh, I mean, this is a, a question that comes up on prepping channels all the time. Uh, you know, at least with anybody that has any kind of a heart, it's, it's not an easy thing to say. It's just like, well, I'll just turn everybody away or, like, you know, no food for anybody. But it's a, it's a big... It's a big question, and I don't think anybody really has a particularly great answer to it. If you live in a society where the majority of people fail to make any kind of preparations for their own welfare and their own well-being, you can only carry so much on your shoulders. And, uh, you know, you have family members and, uh, you know, friends, and you try to help as many as you can, but there's ultimately there's, there's, uh, there's a limit to it. And, I'm, you know, there are... When we're in here, there are going to be people that are perfectly good people that are sealed out on the outside, but, you know, you can only fit so many people in, and um, it's sad. I mean, it's a sad thing about prepping. It's, it's the tragedy that we see before it's even happened, and it is tragic. I always want to uh, finish up before we go on to anything else. I'm not going to open this up because it's kind of toxic. Uh, this is a sheet of 16, uh, 16, uh, 1 16th of an inch thick lead sheeting. Uh, it's a big roll in here. Uh, it's, like, it's like aluminum foil, except like way thicker. Uh, and uh, that lead she uh, shielding could be used like a, like do an extra wrap on my head. I mean, it could go around like your your waist or something like that. It's just a way of adding a little bit of extra shielding to whatever uh, whatever kind of setup we uh, we create. So I'm thinking about maybe turning up the fan a little bit. Are you doing okay? Okay, so you're, you're chilly. Okay, we're, we're learning. Right. And I'm not going to pull out the box, but we also have respirators for uh, um, for going out. Because if you if you're going to be out there, you uh, yeah. if you're going to be outside, you definitely need to uh, not be breathing in materials. Uh, I'm going to give you two blankets, River, because I figure if I give them to you now, you won't need them later. Well, you're, you're cold because you're dressed in like summer clothes. All right. Mm. Sorry. The, the, uh, okay, I guess I guess we're set on that stuff. There is one box of things I, 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 did, I didn't get to, and this is pretty important. Uh, books. We have a whole bunch of books, and we had extra books from our library. And there's, well, I guess this is kind of a school book here. It's about civics. Um, but there's just a ton of just old books that we have here. You know, we got two two boxes, so we can do a lot of reading while we're in there. We got a Faraday cage. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. All the things in the Faraday cage. 
Whoever, do you want to try out the beds? We can try to get you ready for the beds. Do you have any other questions for right now? Uh, some earlier someone was wondering about what are we going to do if we don't have power? We might potentially suffocate if we don't have, you know, the yeah. air circulation system right. working. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this question, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the um, we're gonna go to uh, the video clip where I'm prepping to come in here because I, I, I want to make sure we have a chance to, to share that with you guys because that's really important like all the things all the steps you need to do in your house because some of them are really critical um, there's also a concern that somebody might try to block our vents to force us out or use yeah. it as like some kind of threat like let me in or I'm going to suffocate you basically right right um, well you know that, 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 that gets back to what I said earlier where you know it's not perfect uh, if I were going to do this better, I would uh, have multiple air intakes and they would go out far away from the shelter and they'd be under like rock and debris piles where they're not really obvious or anything like that. Yeah, what we're doing here, it's not perfect. It's it's far from ideal, um, but it's heck of a lot better than nothing. And, uh, you know, for that, I feel, uh, you know, okay about that. Uh, I know a lot of people live in environments where you get neighbors really breathing down your neck. We don't live in an environment like that. I mean, the closest neighbor is like almost a mile away from us. Everyone in this area is really spread out, and um, you know, we're not going to have as much of that kind of uh, issue as other people will. But yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. You know, things can never be perfect, and uh, I guess you'd figure it out uh, as you go. But yeah, there are certainly there's so many uh, weaknesses. If there was a forest fire, our vents are going to burn up. You know, and that's certainly something you could imagine if there was a war going on. So there's all sorts of uh, potential issues, but you know, we're doing the best that we can uh, with them. There was. Uh, the question about power. I'm going to uh, address the electrical question, and then w let's go to this um, uh, to the video clip of uh, pre preparing to come in here, and then we'll come back and we'll do more questions. And if you have any questions during that video clip, you can write them down. So uh, for electricity and power in here, let's just call it power. Um, we've got three la three layers to it. Uh, we have two electrical layers, and then the we, the last layer is uh, human muscle power. Um, the first layer is electrical power coming from our house. We have an electrical line that comes from our house, from our solar system in our house, and that is sending us, uh, you know, all the power that would normally run our house just for running this small space. So that's an awful lot of power. That doesn't mean that it's not going to get damaged or something or it's not going to go down. If it does go down, we have a secondary power system that's pretty much all in this space. It has a whole other set of solar panels. They're just up above us. They come in here. There's some um, electrical equipment uh, just over by the doorway there. We've got 10 deep cycle batteries underneath the entryway. And uh, that is our secondary layer. If the first one goes down, uh, you know, we have that. Maybe both of them go down. If both go down, what we have to do is we need to manually pump air into here, and we do have a technique for doing that. I'll show you guys that after we come back from this uh, clip showing how I got prepared to come in here, and we're also going to talk about the, the steps that Amber and River are doing because those uh, those are also critical. So let's bring up that clip right here. And again, if you write any questions while this plays, we'll make sure that we draw them down ourselves so we can uh, we can answer them. Okay, so the purpose of this video is to show you some of the procedures that we're going to be doing before we head out into the shelter if we ever need to use it. We've got everything written down in lists, and I think that's really important because uh, things are going to be hectic, people are going to be nervous, and there's an awful lot to do. Uh, you know, we've got a lot prepared out uh, in the shelter, but there's some things that we kind of have to wait until the last minute to do. Now, we've got a bunch of lists, and they're being kept right in this drawer here. Uh, there's one for each of us. You know, the one for my boy and, and for Amber is a lot simpler than the one for me. This is my list, and uh, I actually put my, my real name. My real name isn't Praxis. I'm not sure that everyone knows that. I've redacted it on here <laughs> for what that's worth. And um, we're going to go through my procedures. Now, other people have some other things uh, that are pretty important as well. Uh, you know, Amber's doing some things, and uh, River's doing some things, and we'll talk about that, uh, you know, when we get back to the, the live. But I'm going to go through my uh, procedures. The first thing on my list is to close the air vent above the kitchen sink. That's right up over here. And the reason we want to close that is that is outside air being uh, brought into the house. Now it's running through filters, uh, but it's grabbing the air from a filter box that is shared with the uh, with the shelter that we're going to be going in. So we don't want both the house and the uh, the shelter competing for air. We don't need to be running electricity through any of this stuff to bring air into the house. So I want to shut this thing down so that when we're drawing air into the shelter, we are not drawing air from the house. We're drawing the air from the filter box. And I'll show you that outside uh, as we go by. 
Uh, and the, the reason for that is mainly just because if we're drawing air into the shelter from that vent, uh, that's going to create a negative pressure inside the house and that's going to be made up by every little crack around every little window and door uh, you know in the entire house you know windows always have little cracks let's see if I can kind of find some they're usually pretty obvious uh, here's one right here like right in there you, know, you can see daylight coming right in there so there are, there are cracks everywhere and if we are creating a negative uh, pressure environment like a vacuum inside the house that's going to be made up from somewhere and that's going to bring air from outside into the house and we don't want to be doing that we want to minimize the amount of fallout that's getting into the house because who knows after we emerge from the shelter there's you know reasonable chance that maybe we don't have anywhere to go and we kind of have to continue being here and if we're living in this house wouldn't it be nice if there's less fallout inside the house now you know we can do things like clean it up and everything but you know the less it comes in the less we have to clean up and the better of a situation we're going to have so that's the first thing on the list is close down that vent make sure we're not drawing air into the house the second thing we want to be doing is uh closing down all the dampers on this wood stove you can see the wood stove is going right now um, we've got a uh a little uh, valve control right there and there's a damper control on the other side and I want to shut down both of these and the reason is is that uh, if you're not familiar with you know using a wood stove you'll put uh, firewood in the in the beginning and you'll you'll light it and y it'll kind of start getting up to temperature and at, at some point uh, you want to reduce the amount of air that's getting to the fire. You know, you have everything kind of open at the beginning to get the thing going. Uh, but if you leave all the, all those valves open, uh, the fire is going to overheat. And that's going to be a real problem because, I mean, it can dangerously overheat. And you could get a chimney fire. And this whole stack here could all go cherry red. And, you know, essentially we could burn the house down. So what we want to make sure that we do is we want to make sure that we are uh, closing that thing down so that, if we just threw some wood in or whatever, uh, it's not going to overheat and uh, uh, you know burn down the house. Additionally, it, it gets its air from outside, has an outside air adapter. Uh, the pipe, uh, if you watch the video series about how we built this house, the pipe is under underground here. It goes all the way over to here. Underground does a 45 degree bend and goes outside, out into the greenhouse over there, uh, and we're drawing the air from the greenhouse. The reason we did that was because uh, it made it so that we didn't have to have a vent just sticking up out of the ground, uh, you know, somewhere outside. And also, you're getting air that's kind of partially uh, already uh, warmed a little bit from the greenhouse. It's also bringing in fresh air into the greenhouse whenever we're running the fire so that the greenhouse will be less humid because uh, that can kind of be an, an issue. Um, but if we were running the fire and we you know, don't want to be drawing air into the greenhouse because the air is radioactive, it'd be good to again shut the thing off. So that's the next thing on the list is make sure we shut down the wood stove. Uh, then we're going to go into the pantry. There's a few things we've got to do in the pantry and we're going to kind of rattle those things off for you right now. So you notice the pantry is kind of messy. It's really, really been stocked. Uh, you know, we're getting, trying to get ourselves to a position where we get an awful lot of food. Uh, if this thing happens, I'm sure that the federal government, uh, here in the United States anyway, is gonna let everyone know that the food is safe to eat, you know, after like a certain amount of time. You know, kind of in the same way that like all these artificial colors and all these artificial additives, it's like they're all quote unquote safe. And it's like, um, you know, the, the argument being that, well, if this stuff was dangerous, you'd see, like, you know, people having all these sorts of health issues and everything, which is exactly what you see here in the United States. So uh, I tend to take, you know, whatever authorities say with a grain of salt. I understand that their objectives are different than mine. Their objectives are keeping the society going. My objective is to keep my family as safe as I possibly can. And when they say things are safe, quote unquote, uh, it's different from what my definition is safe. So we've really, really stocked up the pantry and we're just trying to keep it all topped off so that, uh, you know, if this thing happens, we have plenty of food. Maybe we are eating some food that is coming, uh, you know, uh, from outside, but the less of that, the better. And if we can get the majority of our food from the stuff that is completely pristine, and totally clean. <laughs> I say that as like there's gummy bears right here. <laughs> okay, you know, you know, it's completely clean. Uh, well, you know, these are organic. They are organic gummy bears. Um, you know, we're going to be in a better health uh, situation. And that's one thing I hear all the time here on prepping channels. Someone will say, well, like, uh, you know, just, well, he, he, here's a pretty good example right here. This is not the best ramen, uh, you know, th this kind of stuff. There's, you know, artificial preservatives and things like that in here. Uh, but you never want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, we're stocking up, you know, 
could we get better food? Yeah, we, we totally could if we had a little bit more money. But, um, you know, that's something you just have to deal with. You know, sure, after this uh, happens, if it happens, we might be in a situation where we're eating some amount of radioactive material. But if you can get that number smaller, you're going to be better off. You know, it's not like you, you don't have to just throw in the towel if, uh, you know, you're, you can't be 100% perfect, you know, because, you know, None of us get out of this life alive. You just do the best you can. So the first thing I do in here isn't to chit chat about all my pantry stuff. The first thing I'm supposed to do when I get in here is to swap the internet cable wire. And that is that is right here. We've got internet coming into the house here with this little orange wire. It kind of comes down here, goes underneath, blah, blah, blah. And it goes into this grounding block here. You see the orange wire coming in from the bottom, goes into the grounding block. And this uh, is the uh, connection that goes up to the router. So that's bringing internet into our house. This dangling thing here is what goes into the shelter. That tube leads to the shelter. And first thing I need to do is swap this over. Now, I do, do I think that we're definitely going to have great internet access, uh, you know, while this is all going on? No. In fact, I think, you know, that'll be one of the first things to go down. But all it cost me to set this thing up was this. I bought one wire and I, I, I spend like 10 seconds doing, doing a swap and it's one additional possible way of getting information uh, to us. Again, do I think it's likely that that's going to be up and running? Probably not, but maybe and I'd love to take advantage of it if it is, if only for the entertainment purposes uh, of having internet access. So uh, next thing on the list here is turn on water to the shelter. Uh, we also have water running into the shelter. You can see that blue blue hose line right there. And that's coming from right here. We've got the pressure tank and here's the well water coming in and it goes into the house up that way. That's where it heads up into the house. But right here, this is pretty normal on a, uh, a well setup where you have the pressure tank and then you'll have this little split off right here with the spigot uh, inside your house. And this is like for draining out the system or whatever. Well, I took advantage of this and I attached a split to it and I'll talk about what's going on with the split in a, in a moment. And from here, I go into this block here, which is a pressure reducer. This brings the pressure from 50 PSI, which is what's going on in the house. Is that what it says? Oh, it's 55 PSI going into the house. This will reduce it to 20. And it can, it can turn it to anything that I want, as long as it's less than 55. Uh, with this little screw here, I've got it tuned down to 20. The reason for that is I... You know, these are just, these are garden, well, not garden hoses. These are like potable water hoses for like RVing and whatnot. And, you know, there's no reason to put them uh, under high pressure stress. You know, it, we don't need to deliver an enormous amount of water super quickly to the shelter. It's just getting us some water in there. And if we can do it at 20 PSI and keep everything safe and make it less likely that there's going to be a leak or anything like that, uh, I feel a lot safer that way. So that's why we have the pressure reducer. The reason we have this T over here uh, is uh, for draining the system later. I, if, once we run water through, we want to be able to drain that out. And this is our way of draining it out. And I've got a, a shut off here and I've got a shut off here. And whenever I have a hose open to the inside of the house, I always like to put uh, some kind of a double redundancy shut off. Like it, with this spigot just here by itself, I, I had a little shut off past it because like what, what happens if I'm like working in here and I, I just tap this thing and it opens it up and it starts spraying water all over the floor it's always good to have kind of a, a little bit of redundancy so in case I accidentally tap this we get another shut off here I think that's all, just always a great thing to have that's you know the prepper in me you want to think about what could go wrong and have some kind of a, a backup against it so having a double redundancy shut off I think is a really good idea the next thing we want to do in here is to turn off water to the house that is uh, this valve right here. I want to shut that off. And, uh, you know, that's just in case, who knows, you know, like if there's a leak somewhere in the house and we start spraying water in the house, I don't want to go in for two weeks while we're in the shelter. I don't think that's very likely. I think it's almost like a zero, as close to a zero percent chance of that happening as I can possibly imagine, but it's not exactly zero. So, uh, you know, I, I figured why not just flip that switch and have a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, security that way. The one last thing that we're going to do be before we leave the pantry here uh, is I got a window here and in the winter I leave this pantry window open. It's got a little block there so it can't get pushed open by a raccoon or anything like that. Although I, I really got to reinforce that screen so mice can't just come right in. I haven't seen any mice come in yet but uh, you know what? It's really the kind of thing you want to fix it before it happens instead of after it happens. But anyway, I want to close this window. Uh, the reason I keep it open is so that it can be nice and cool in the pantry. This is kind of a, a cool outdoor environment. Here's a thermometer. All right here, we are rocking what? I'm going to give it to you in Celsius. It's like about 12 degrees 
Celsius right there. That's pretty good temperature for a pantry. And uh, that allows us to keep it cool without having to use the air conditioner, which is up there. We have an air conditioner to keep it cool in the uh, summertime uh, in here to try to keep it, you know, no higher than 55 degrees uh, in here. Uh, but in the winter, you get a lot of free cooling. So I want to make sure I close that though. So, you know, obviously we don't have fallout ash coming in. Now we are going to be coming back in here and we're going to be doing something with this breaker box here. We definitely need to address that, but I'm not going to uh, flip any breaker switches now because let's say this happens in the middle of the night, it's dark, do I want to be shutting off lights to the house while other people are still trying to do things? No. So uh, I am going to be back. We are going to shut off some breakers and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but we're not going to do that right away because again, you know, if people, other people are doing things, it's not just me in here. Uh, we don't want to plunge the whole house into darkness yet. So we're going to head out for the time being. And on my list, there's one thing that it, it asked me to grab and I'll get it right here. And it says, um, after I turn off, oh, there's one other thing I was supposed to do in there. See, that's why we have lists. <laughs> We're going to go back. There's one other thing. I think the list is terribly critical uh, because, it, you know, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be scatterbrained. I'm sure my boy's going to be asking me questions. Amber's going to be asking me questions. Uh, it's really critical to have a list and kind of go through it uh, one step at a time. Uh, this this uh, air exchanger right here, we're just going to turn the whole system uh, turn the whole system off. Uh, and that is just to make it so we're not pumping air into the house. We're not competing with the shelter for air because they, they, they share the same filter. So we're just going to shut this whole thing, shut that whole thing down. All right. And we're going to finally get out of here. The next thing on here is, uh, it refers to a cash box. Now we, we keep it cash in the house and, uh, I want to, I want to remove the cash box, uh, from the safe and we're going to bring it out to the shelter. That's this item right here. Remove cash box. Uh, from the safe. Uh, the reason we're doing that isn't because we're going to like start our own economy living down in the in the shelter there. Uh, but the reason we want to do that is because, uh, you know, it, it would not surprise me at all. I mean, these are just a bunch of glass windows. If we get out of the shelter and maybe people had, you know, helped themselves to what's in the house. You now, that is not unreasonable at all. Uh, it's not something I'd like to have happen, and we're going to do what we can to try to prevent that, but it could totally happen. So if it happens, I want to make sure that we have at least some of the critical things that we would want to have preserved for ourselves. And one of those things is to have cash. It'd be really important to have cash so that you can engage in you know, uh, trade transactions with people so that you can you know, get things that you might need after the fact because a lot of electronic systems might be down. So uh, I'm not going to walk through the house and uh, you know, detail where all that stuff is, but that is one thing that we'd be doing. And after that, it says, take a trip out to the shelter. I, may, I was very explicit with where the trips out to the shelter are so that I could think ahead about like, well, how much is, you know, should I be carrying whatever? And, uh, you know, know when it's time to go out there. Next thing on this list is grab my special tub. Uh, everyone in the house has a, uh, a special uh, tub that just has, you know, whatever personal items they might want to uh, have out in the shelter, things we don't want to leave out there all the time, but uh, things we want to bring out. So everyone has their tub, it's in their room, it's ready to go, it's already pre-packed uh, with some things and any extra things we might want to grab in there and put in. Some things I'm going to be putting in there is some ammunition. We're going to be bringing some ammunition out, uh, you know, some pistols out there. Uh, and we're also uh, going to be in the library and I'll just show you where some of this stuff is. All this stuff is going to go into the tub. The, the tub will help me to move a lot of this stuff. Right in the library we have some books and specifically I want to grab this one right here, Nuclear War, Survival Skills. There's an awful lot of really, really good information in that book, and I want to make sure that I uh, bring that along with me. So we're going to grab that, that book and take it with us. Um, what else we have? Uh, well, we ha have an entertainment center over here. It's Christmas time, so we got a Christmas tree. We're not going to be bringing the Christmas tree with us. If the camera will focus on... Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, We've got a little entertainment area. This is kind of neat. We put all the uh, like DVD player and everything up in the wall here. It's taking advantage of space that is above uh, the washing machines behind that wall there. And we don't use a clothes dryer. As you can see, we got clothes drying racks over there. So uh, we ate into that area and we used it for this stuff. So we're going to come here and there are some movies on these hard drives. Um, you know, I figured, you know, why not bring a video game system? It's just, you know, something to do. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this exercise game. Uh, that's, that's my exercise all the time. So, uh, you know, I'll be uh, up here and I'll be grabbing that stuff and that'll go into my, my special tub. What else is in here? Uh, my list says now that I've grabbed that, it's time for another trip out to the shelter. 
Uh, the next thing uh, we're going to be doing is uh, grabbing uh, laptops, computers, uh, those will give us access to the internet for information, and they're also going to give us, uh, you know, the ability to, you know, ha for, have entertainment. That's on the list, so we would grab the laptops in the house. One is from my desk over there. Uh, we keep another one downstairs for River School. And then it says, take another trip out to the shelter. Uh, and here we've got a little check right here. Just uh, if we can get some light on it. There we go. And it says, check to be sure everyone is done in-house, which involves me screaming to everyone, is everyone done inside the house? Uh, if everyone is, what that means is that now I can turn off non-shelter breakers. So let's go back to the, the breaker, and I'll show you what that is going to look like. All right, so we're back in the pantry again. And here's the breaker box, and I made it easy for myself with the yellow sticky notes. So everything, all the breakers in this box get turned off except for the ones that have the little yellow uh, uh, sticky notes on them. So this thing says uh, shelter, leave it on, and this is the refrigerator. Now this is not uh, a refrigerator in the shelter, this is a refrigerator in the house, but there's no reason to lose all the food in the fridge. It doesn't use that much electricity. I think it would be okay to leave it on, and I'm going to leave that one on. Uh, over here, this is where the, uh, the, the solar uh, from our roof is being put into the panel so this one needs to be on and this is the grid power from the street which needs to be off this uh, this little thing here is a, uh, uh, a safety so you can't turn the street power on and the uh, the solar power on at the same time uh, it's a great little thing my dad engineered and it guarantees that you can't uh, do major damage by uh, bleeding the two together All right down here we got a couple other things we want to uh, make sure we leave on, this is the uh, well, so we want to make sure we leave that on so we can leave uh, have pressure, uh, water pressure to the well. And this is an electricity feed that goes to the shelter itself, it's just, you know, electrical power going out there. Everything else in here gets turned off. So as long as the things that are uh, noted get kept on, we're good to go. Alright, next thing, let's look at the list. Um, so we uh, just do that. We turned off all the non-shelter breakers. Okay, and now we lock all the doors. Uh, and you know the reasons for that are you know kind of obvious, just to try to you know minimize how much uh, risk we have with people coming into the house. Obviously, we have lots of uh, weak access points. You know, there's uh, windows, but you know we may as well uh, lock all of our doors just to uh, you know if it if it deters someone. I think it's worth doing. Now, it's not going to deter anybody that's uh, determined, but, you know, uh, not everyone is as determined as everyone else. And this notes right here that uh, after I lock all the doors, that's the final trip out, which makes sense. Um, I just want to uh, talk a little, you know, actually, I'll save it for the live stream. I want to talk about some of the other people's uh, things that they're going to be doing, but um, we'll save that for the live stream. We'll go over their exact list, because uh, some of the, some other people do have uh, important tasks. I have, I have some of the most critical but other people do have important tasks that, uh, that can't be ignored, too, and that's why they have their own lists. Okay, so we're going to head outside. We just had a fair bit of snow. I spent all morning plowing and shoveling. It is really mushy stuff. Uh, before we uh, head up towards the next thing on my list, and there are more things on the list, I, I want to just take a look myself and show, show you guys what's going on on the roof up there. We've got snow the entire roof is not cleared and that, that that that's you know that could definitely be an issue you know if there was a large scale nuclear exchange you know that throws a lot of debris up in the sky the idea of there being a, a plunge down towards um uh you know cool temperatures you could get a lot you know snow falling uh, easily and it could certainly cover up our solar panels and reduce our ability or completely eliminate our ability to get power uh the power that we have is not 100% necessary, I don't think. I definitely hope that we have power. I want power, not just for like running electronic devices, but like keeping uh, you know, fans going and things like that. But if it goes down, I think that we're gonna, you know, we'll be able to muddle through, but that'll definitely be a thing. And it's not just snow, you know, you know the dust itself could settle and cake all over the, uh, all over the panels and certainly reduce their, uh, their ability to, uh, to generate electricity. I just shoveled off those solar hot water panels this morning. Okay, I, uh, 
Well, you can see what I'm wearing on my feet. These <laughs> just loafers with no grip. You know, I, 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 there are much better ways of, uh, of going about uh, getting to our shelter. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go the, the idiot way, which would have me uh, trudging through a bunch of snow. So I'm going to come back this way. I apologize. I didn't think this one through. See, if it had been on my list that said, like, exit through the other entryway, I wouldn't have made this mistake. Okay, let's just go right back. <laughs> go right back on in. We're gonna exit through the other side where the chickens are. Now, a lot of you guys have expressed concerns over our chickens. Like, what are we gonna do with our chickens? Um, well, you know, the plan for the chickens at the moment is to just kind of let them free in the greenhouse. Uh, you know, fill up their water, dump out their food bags, and wish them good luck. And th that's kind of all we can do. Uh, chickens, uh, there's no way we could bring the chickens. In there. Hey guys! Dude, these guys love getting their bellies rubbed. This one, this is rice crackers. I'm rubbing rice crackers' belly right now. And this is Chipmunk, and she loves her belly getting rubbed. And then Crow. Crow loves her belly. And then this is Chubbs. It's the male rooster. I'm trying to, I'm trying to pet you, bro. Okay, they all, they all love their belly rubs now. It used to just be rice crackers right in the middle that loved their bellies rubbed. But now they all love it. Okay, uh, you guys need to, I'm gonna close the door. I'm gonna close the door. You need to, I always have to watch their toes, see their toes there, I don't want to crush them. Okay, I'm gonna, you guys gotta turn around. Okay, yeah. you, you gotta remember the procedure. Okay, yeah, just kind of go, I know, I know, I know, you love your belly rub. Here you go, here you go. It's crazy in the back, she, everyone, everyone always is mean to crazy. I'll give you a little rub before we go. And you chubs, there you go. We've got one more called BB, but he's in the back. He's a little bantam. Okay, so there's the chickens. Um, yeah, you know, I don't, I, you know, you can't save them all. So I think that's kind of the plan with them. Uh, we're keeping this path permanently shoveled to make sure that we can always get back to the shelter when we need to. And heading back there is what we're doing, gonna be doing right now. Um, now, I, I'm just gonna kind of zoom around this right here is our uh, air intake box. It's got a tub over the top. I haven't built a roof for it yet. Uh, but if I can come around a little bit, you can see there are two pipes going down into the ground. The one on the right goes into the shelter. The one on the left goes into the house. And you can see that both of them are sucking air out of the same filter box. So that's why we want to shut down the air uh, that goes uh, into the house so that it's not competing. Uh, I do have some things in this shed that we are going to be bringing in uh, if this thing is ever real. Um, and that's right on this, this list here. Uh, that is uh, camping bags from the shed. I have a bag that has some food in there. Uh, my camping bag has like uh, extra um, uh, sleeping bags, blankets, uh, sheets and bedding. Uh, there's like pots and pans and things like that. We're gonna grab all that. We're not gonna have that in there for the test because uh, I don't think it's really required for the test, but those would be extra things that we would have. And then the last item on the list right here is cover the garden and the root cellar with plastic sheeting from the shed. Now that's kind of optional. Why do I have that uh, mentioned? Uh, well, the reason, again, the same idea about wanting to prevent uh, radiation from getting into the house, well, not radiation, but radioactive particles, um, Here's our garden area. Uh, if we can prevent uh, radioactive material from falling in that dirt area, it will make it so that the, the food that we grow is going to be that much less contaminated. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not. But again, and I say this all the time on my channel because people are always saying this, you know, if you're doing something and it's not perfect, you know, you might as well not do anything at all. I, I don't prescribe to that at all. Uh, you know, it's all about just making things better. And if we can reduce the amount of radiation that is in our food growing in our garden, if we are in a situation where we just have nowhere else to go, you know, it's like, you know, too many areas are blanketed. You, you know, we all know the way that refugees are treated in this world. Maybe our best chance is to just, you know, do the best that we can here. Maybe we're stuck here. There's just nowhere else to go. And we got to, you know, grow out of the ground. If we have to grow food out of the ground, wouldn't we be better off if we had covered that ground with plastic tarps during the, the thick of it? Uh, versus having not done that. You know, is it ideal? Absolutely not. But is it better? Yeah, it's better. And all this stuff, it's just about, you know, making things better. Uh, I also mentioned putting uh, plastic tarps over the, uh, the shelter itself. And you can kind of see the top of the shelter right behind the uh, filter box there. We're coming around to the, the doorway of the shelter. Uh, the reason that I was thinking it might be a good idea to put plastic tarps on is, uh, as I was building this, there is something like 
uh, eight or nine inches of concrete on the ceiling. And on top of that, there's about two feet worth of dirt on, to, uh, on top of the concrete. And that's great. Uh, you know, that's a pretty good amount of uh, shielding. But that shielding only works if the radioactive particles stay up on the top surface of the dirt. If you get radioactive particles falling down on top of the shelter, and then it rains, which, I mean, why the heck wouldn't it rain, you know? Those radioactive particles, that dust, is going to get washed down into the soil. And if it's getting washed down into the soil, it may take that particle from the top of the dirt, which is like two feet away from you, down, I mean, it could wash it a foot down into the dirt, or two feet down into the dirt, uh, you know, if it's really fine stuff. And suddenly, the only protection you have is that, you know, eight or nine inches of concrete on the ceiling. So I think it would be a really good idea, if we feel we have the time to do it, uh, to put a plastic tarp over at least, you know, the majority of the top of that thing to try to make it so that if we get a bunch of dust falling and then rain, that the, uh, that, uh, you know, it's not getting pushed down into the, to, into the soil. Now, I mentioned uh, the idea that that would be something we do if we feel like we have time. Um, how do we know how much time we have? I mean, uh, I, I already uh, mentioned that, it, you know, my, my feelings on the... Uh, uh, absolute believability of, of government reports. I mean, you know, they sometimes don't have perfect information themselves, and then on top of that, there's always, like, the, try, the attempt to mitigate a panic. I, you know, so you're not going to be able to turn on the radio, and they're not going to be able to give you an exact uh, uh, answer to how much time you have at your location before things get dangerous. Now, we do have Geiger counters, and we can use those, but uh, I, I really want to save the Geiger counters uh, for you know, during and after. I don't want to be bumbling around with them. Maybe it's raining. I don't want to get them wet. So what we have are these little cards, and I'll show you the cards when we do the live stream uh, later on. We have these little cards, and the purpose of the cards is that they uh, absorb radiation, and uh, they're used within, you know, industries where people are exposed to radio radiation. And in the same way that everyone is going to get one of these lists, uh, everyone is going to get a card. So as it, we're moving around, we're going to be able to check our card. And if our card starts changing color at all, we will know there is radiation in the area and we need to wrap it up. You know, it's like th that's why on the list, the absolutely most important critical things are first on the list. You know, making sure that you have water out in the shelter. Uh, you know, making sure that the house doesn't burn down. Like all those kind of things. You know, things later on are important. You know, getting weapons and, and movies and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's nice to turn off all the... Uh, breakers in the house and lock all the doors but you know you're not going to die if you don't turn off all the breakers in the house you're not going to die if you don't lock all the doors of the house you will die if you don't have water you know so we, we have the important things up first so if we have those little cards and the cards are telling us you know there is radiation in this area you got to get your ass inside we can we can do that so again i'll show you the cards that we're using i think they're called like tri rad or something like that cards These are little yellow cards uh right now you can get them for about uh, 20 bucks a pop uh, i'll try to put a link down in the description if you want to pick up one of those i think they've recently been going up a little bit but you know they're, they're, they're still uh totally uh 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 achievable i think and if you can't afford a geiger counter which is you know incredibly expensive it at least gives you some degree of not being blind so uh, I think that I've covered pretty much everything. Why don't we head back into the uh, shelter and we can talk about what we're doing in the actual test. Okay, thank you very, very much for that. That was part of our, you know, we've got to make a list. Okay, so um, what I was saying silently earlier is that while we were uh, you know, doing that video, we've turned up the volume of the air. You can probably hear it a little bit louder. Let me know in the comments if it's too much. We can turn it down a little bit if it's too loud uh, because the fan is directly underneath the computer that we're using for the live stream here. We got several questions, uh, but what we're trying to do is just bring down the, uh, the CO2 level as quickly as we can. Unfortunately, the meters that we are using, they work over longer time periods. There's not like minute to minute changes. Um, so it, it may take a little bit of uh, time to see a dent. If it doesn't work out within the duration of this live stream, uh, and this live stream kind of has a soft exit, I think it's just sort of like when everyone leaves, we, you know, we're like, okay, well, I guess it's the end of the live stream. Um, I, I'll give you guys an update one way or the other on how everything worked out, but uh, let's get to some of these questions first. There were a lot of really good ones. Uh, well, the first one wasn't really a question.
question, but someone was suggesting, you know, since our vents are kind of obvious, maybe we could right, plant right. Uh, thorn bushes around them to sort of deter people yeah. from tampering with it. Well, one of the things that we did when I created the, the vents up there and also the, um, uh, the light tubes was to try to make them, like, not really obvious for what they were. Uh, the light tubes are just uh, a four-inch PVC, no, no, it's ABS black pipe coming out of the ground with glass ashtrays, silicone glued down to the top of them. And I grow a lot of plants there, so uh, in the summer and the summertime, springtime, you're not uh, you're not really seeing those things that much. The uh, the air intake, I mean, what the hell does that thing look like? It looks like like a Star Wars walker without a head made out of wood. I'm not really sure what it is. It actually got attacked by a bear, uh, like really early on, like right after we had built it, because the, the presumption is, uh, my money is on the idea that it, the bear thought it was like a beehive or something like that. So we are trying to make the things less obvious. Uh, but again, you know, it, it comes down to the idea that when you're interacting with humans, when there's somebody that wants to do something, it's really hard to make a bulletproof I don't know, literal and figurative solution to things when you have a thinking mind that can kind of come around it. But obviously, yeah, hiding it would be good. If I were going to do this thing, um, you know, from scratch, what I would want to do would, uh, well, A, I'd want to make it a little bit bigger. There was a question about why do we make it so small. I'm going to address that a little bit more uh, right now. Uh, I would make it a little bit bigger. I would make all the vents completely hidden. I would make multiple vents coming in from uh, different directions. Uh, the uh, the exhaust would be uh, coming in from different directions. The entrance would uh, have a much more fortified door and would be much less obvious. If I, you know, we're going to do this in a more perfect way, but, you know, we, we have what we have. So uh, before we get to the other questions, I, I, I do want to just kind of springboard onto like, why didn't we make this place bigger? Well, the reason, uh, you know, the short reason is that this is just a really ridiculously large refrigerator. That's what it was built as. I mean, this is absurdly large for a refrigerator. And the reason that I made it the size that I did was, you know, yeah, we have plenty of room, you might as well use it. You know, adding an extra uh, you know, foot dimension on something, it's like, it's not that much more concrete, it's not a big deal. Uh, the reason we made it the size that we did is because here in New England, there is just ledge everywhere. We had the excavators working, we were trying to find like a large area where we could kind of dig down and not have a bunch of underground mountains, which is what ledge uh, are, which is what ledge is, interfering with our plans. But it's really hard. Uh, there's a huge piece of ledge out this way. This wall here has a huge piece of ledge on it. That wall, wall there has like a, a piece of ledge coming in. We kind of nestled it in amongst all the ledge, and you know we did the best that we could. But um, yeah, would, would I like it to be bigger? Yes. And bucket list someday. I'd, I'd really love to make like a bag end hobbit house off to the, the east of this property. There's a great place where I can make a really large underground house. I'd like to do that someday, like if the Holocaust doesn't kill us first. That's definitely on my bucket list. Um, I think that'd be really great to do. But yeah, we were constrained uh, by, you know, the budget, uh, essentially, because, you know, you can jackhammer through rock, but it's really, really expensive. As it is, this space cost us $11,000, and that's a, that's a pretty expensive refrigerator. Um, if I knew it was going to be that much, I don't know that I even would have gone for it. It just it took so long to excavate out the space. That was where a lot of the, the, uh, the effort went into. Um, but um, yeah, that's why we made it the size we did. What other questions do we have? Um, so we had a concern, again, about like potential intruders. We have a wooden door. They could probably easily break through Yeah, they that. could easily break through it. And they'd be met with a response to that. <laughs> I mean, that, that's why you saw in the video, I, I talked a little bit about some of the things that we would be bringing in. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they'd be met with response to that. Again, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with the thinking mind, you know, you, you can't make it absolutely foolproof. And, uh, you know, you, we're doing the best that we can. But, yeah, and it, it, we have an enormous amount of protection in here uh, from uh, projectiles. Uh, but, I mean, there'd be so many ways. I mean, you could smoke us out of here. I'm just giving you guys ideas, you know, if you ever come by. You could smoke us out of, out of here. You could, uh, you know, throw some kind of, like, a flaming whatever through the front door. There's, it's, a, it, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And, we, you know, we're doing the best that we can. But that's great that we're talking about these things. So if, you, if you're thinking about building your own, these might be things that you do want to work into uh, your plan. Here, where we live out in the sticks, I don't plan on getting that much of that. But if you live in an area where you think there's going to be a lot of people up in your business, that might be something you want to spend a lot more time on than we have. Because everybody's got a different situation. If you are at sea level, you know, you're going to have a much different plan 
for you know uh, you know hurricane high tides than somebody who lives in the middle of the desert at like 15,000 feet up in the air. So you know everybody's got different challenges, and our challenge is not quite is heavy in the, in, the, in that uh, direction, just because of where we live. We are just so far from everything. Um, let, let's do another question, but first I want to show you guys this. Maybe you could read the question. Okay. This is our bathing setup. I wanted to share with you a little bit. I'm not, I'm not going to set it up completely, but I wanted to give you a sense of what we're doing for bathing. Um, I don't feel that I really need to, uh, to practice with this much because essentially what, what this is is the same kind of a bathing setup that I do when I go camping. When I go camping, what I do is I get a, a, a pot of warm water that I've warmed over the fire, and I just stand there with a washcloth, and from the top to the bottom, I just scrub myself off with the washcloth. It's really easy when you do backwoods camping. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging when you're at a family campground <laughs> because, like, you know, there's certain parts you're going to be like, oh, is there anyone looking? If I can get behind this bush, maybe people won't, you know, it's not like I stripped down naked, but, you know, eventually you get to parts of your body that you want to, uh, you got clean that, you know, if people see you with their kids watching, they're going to be like, what is that, that awful man doing over there? <laughs> there might be the scene I was writing in one of my novels. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Art uh, imitates life. Um, but this is what I created for in here, because when you're outside, you can just let everything drip onto the ground, but we can't do that in here. So what I got is it's like a giant body bag. I, I got these huge contractor trash bags like this. And this is comfortable enough for me to stand in. I'm not going to stand in because I'm wearing shoes. Uh, I would, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to ruin the bottom of it. Okay. That's the thing. We've got several of these, so if I get holes in the bottom of it, I can replace it out with another one. But what, the, uh, what this will do is you'll put the bottom, uh, the pot down in the bottom, and you can just do your, your washing in here. All the water just flows uh, down, and then we just take it and dump it down the sink. It's got a couple of uh, grommet holes on the side, and... Well, the cloth is to, uh, if you try to just put a grommet into plastic, the grommet's just going to cut through the plastic. So I put this cloth as a way of uh, kind of padding it out so it wouldn't just cut through the plastic. Yeah. And uh, these bars here, uh, it's just a mounting system, and they essentially grab the two sides of this thing and they hold it right up over here. And before we get to that question, we are going to get to that question. I'm just going to shove this over here. Uh, if we're doing that, you might want a little bit of privacy. We have thought about that, both for you know uh, people using the restroom, but also for showering. We've got I'm a, not sure uh, if they can see you know, it's it. Right over, right over here, we've got a shower curtain. I, I made a little wire that goes across the ceiling here. It just held the tension on either side. And a shower curtain just goes across. That separates out the kind of the bathroom section where the sink is, where the toilet's going to be kept, and you can do uh, you know your showering behind that as well. All right, so what is our question? Um, somebody asked how waterproof the shelter actually is. The water, the, the shelter is pretty good for waterproofing. I mean, it's had two years to try it out. I do have a dehumidifier uh, in here, and it, it runs constantly. I run it for a half an hour a day. It's on a timer. And every day for half an hour it runs, and it is, uh, you know, just pulling water out of the air. If I don't do that, I'm going to get mildew on the walls. Um, you know, after a, a couple of weeks, I'm not sure how bad it would be after a couple of weeks, certainly with people in here, that would be a bit of a challenge. But the, de the dehumidifier, I think we can probably swing that uh, okay on either of the uh, solar electric systems, even if we can't do it every single day. A lot of times when you're running a solar electric system, you get a ton of power when the sun's falling on the panels and then the batteries kind of float you through the night. So if we're just running it when the batteries are topped off and we're peak sun for the day, we can do our dehumidifying during that period and um, you know, that'll keep it pretty dry in here. But in terms of water getting in, it works really, really well. Uh, I put a membrane over part of it, uh, but the, the, the contractors, when they were installing it, they kind of forgot to tell, I, I told them it's like, when you. When you get the, the dirt up on the sides, let me know because I want to. I've got this membrane I want to put on on the whole thing, and they they forgot to tell me when they got dirt up on the sides, so I wasn't able to put the full membrane up. But uh, but even without that, it seems like it's working pretty well. Somebody's wondering if we could take the the dehumidified water, take that out, filter it, and actually be able to use it. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering. Yeah, I, you'd probably be fine not not even filtering be honest. I mean, what, what dehumidifier water is, is it's like, well, if this was a, a glass, like a, hot, a cold glass of lemonade on a hot day, the way dehumidifier works, 
Yeah, I know. Okay, well, let's say it's iced tea. Okay, does that help with your imagination? <laughs> so let's say this is iced tea on a hot day. You know, you're going to get that condensation. That's the way a dehumidifier works. Is it works uh, just like a refrigerator, where it pumps the the coolant through the coils. The coils get cold. You get the condensation on it, and it drips off. And the coils are some kind of a metal. Now. Uh, a couple of downsides with that. I mean, the metal is probably not the cleanest thing in the world, um, you know, so it wouldn't be my first pick to drink. But we do have the Berkey filter here. The, you know, we can filter anything uh, through that. Um, Somebody read that dehumidifier water actually has a lot of lead in it. It might have lead, um, but, you know, the amount that you're going to get during a short period of time. I mean, I'm not giving you guys health advice, and I certainly would not be my go-to, but if I knew I was going to, like, dehydrate to death in two days uh, if I didn't get water, and the alternative is that maybe there's some lead in the water. I don't know, what would you do? Uh, it would suck to get lead poisoning, but at least you're not dying. Of yeah, this. yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it's like, you know, you, you try to make the best options that you have. And we've built things here so that drinking dehumidifier water is way the hell down the list. You know, we've got, uh, I don't know, like about 100 gallons or, or, or so of, of uh, the chlorinated water. We've got a bunch of fresh water. We're not going to get there. One interesting use for that though, um, I w and I'd, I'd love to do more research on this, is that lead acid batteries for a solar electric system, like the kind that we have here, the, right or under the stairs over there, they need distilled water, and I think that that would be distilled water. I mean, because it, it's it's grabbing right out of the air, unless, you know, like you said, you know, the lead, uh, you know, soldering joints or whatever on there. So, you know, I don't have a, a perfect answer to that, but it, it's an interesting uh, question, it's an interesting resource. It certainly wouldn't be my first pick, but if the alternative is dying to, from dehydration in two days, I think it's an interesting possibility. And you can filter it through a Berkey filter. Uh, what else do we got? Uh, somebody is wondering how long it takes for us to, you know, finish these lists, get in here. You know, right. We all said, how much time does that take? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have, we've only done one dry, uh, dry run. We haven't done like a hustle dry run for it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Obviously, you want to get it as tight as you can. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when we did the first dry one, I was telling uh, uh, River and Amber, uh, you might have seen the video that was kind of advertising we were going to do this live stream. People are kind of walking around. People aren't running. And I, that would be the ideal because, you know, people start running around. You know, they're going to bump into things. They're going to slip down the stairs and fall. And then, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's that kind of thing where, you know, you go speeding down the road to get somewhere soon and you're in a car crash. And then you're like, you're even later. So we're trying to set it up so that we can uh, do it as succinctly as possible and uh, that it's done as quickly as possible. I think, I'm thinking 10, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, I kind of came up with that ballpark based on the amount of time that the nearest likely nuclear target, the amount of time it would likely take wind to get here uh, would be at least that amount of time. Uh, but you know, we'd like to get it lower than that. I mentioned in that video that I, I was gonna go over some of the things that other people were doing as well. Um, maybe we could uh, do another question and then we'll kind of go back and forth because Amber has a lot of really critical activities that are on her list that if she didn't do them, we're dead, son. <laughs> so these are important things. Um, somebody was saying, you know, that having the shelter, all this preparation is great and all, but what are we going to do if we happen to be away from home, away from the shelter, we don't have access to it? <laughs> Sucks to be us. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's creating options for yourself, uh, and it's uh, it, it gets into a question that comes up a lot with like uh, you know emergency preparedness. If, if someone prepares for, say, wildfires, you know, was that a useful uh, use of their time? Was that was that a waste of their time? If you know, maybe it's going to be a flood that takes out their house. And I, I don't think so. I mean, if by doing this we can cover ourselves for the amount of time when we're home, which honestly is most of it. I mean, you know, we go out and we do things occasionally. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time we're kind of around the house. It's one of the things about, you know, being a crazy person that moves out to the country because we're so afraid of the world and everything is that it's so awesome and nice out here and peaceful. And it was the most beautiful morning this morning. I, I opened up the, um, uh, the shades uh, and looked outside and the sun was just coming over the rise. It was pink and orange and, and yellow and blue and purples up in the sky. It was n nice new soft snow everywhere. Uh, it was like a, like almost a first quarter moon up in the sky, just a crescent with a little haze over it. It's beautiful out here. I was sitting eating breakfast and a barred owl swooped across our, uh, this was before you got up, uh, swooped across our yard and, and, and it lighted up in a branch in a tree and River and I were looking at it and, um, it's beautiful out here, so we love spending a lot of time out here, and 
because of that we're here a lot. But yeah, if we go someplace else, you know, every time, you know, you uh, you go on a, a trip, you know, you, you, you got you to balance things. Uh, you know, if you decide to stay in your house all the time, then, you know, what's the point of your life if, you you know, you're not also enjoying it? But, but that said, when we go out on short trips, you know, uh, especially now, I'm bringing tools and kind of planning, like, you know, I might not be able to get home. Uh, you know, from this trip, if there's an EMP, the car doesn't work, I'm always planning for it, you know, we may have to be hiking home, so I bring things like paper maps, uh, you know, to be able to get back, and, you know, good walking shoes, I have my EDC pack that I carry all the time with me, uh, you know, lately, I've been doing a uh, personal protective device on me whenever I go out, there's not something in New England I used to do, uh, but it's something I've, I've picked up, so, you know, you try to do the best you can. Uh, let, let me uh, jump on this before we do another question. Okay. All right. Some of the things that Amber has on her list. Uh, one, one thing, this is going to sound like really stupid and, and like superfluous, but it, it's not. Uh, Amber's first thing on our list is move the sprouting containers. We do sprouts for like fresh sprouts for sandwiches and wraps and things like that. She moves the sprouting containers from the house into here. Well, why does she do that? Well, because for two weeks, wouldn't it be nice to have some fresh greens yeah. while we're in here? We got lots of dehydrated stuff, but it, it, I mean, it would give you a lot of nutrition. It would give you, a lot, I mean, it would give me a lot of... Um, happiness <laughs> having some fresh greens uh and uh you know th th that's her first thing out, 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 out the door is grab the sprouting containers dump any water out of the bottom bring it out to the shelter next thing closing and locking all the windows and closing all the blinds i reference this in the little advertisement for this live stream why are we closing all the windows pretty obvious you don't want fallout coming in why are we closing all the blinds the reason we're closing all the blinds is that as sunlight comes into the house it heats the house and warm air, when it, uh, well, when it gets warm, it gets lighter, it's less dense, it rises. That's called a stack effect when, uh, you know, in, in uh, carpentry, carpentry and construction, where when uh, air warms up in a space, it wants to go up, it makes more pressure on the top, and it, co it goes out all the little leaks. You know, I showed in the video, there's always leaks around windows. So if we have sunlight coming into our house, it's warming the air, that air is warming, it's going up, it's going out all the leaks in the upper floor, you're not going to create a vacuum in the house. It's going to be replaced by something, and air from the outside is going to come in the bottom of the house. And by closing the blinds, we're reducing as much as possible that stack effect that would be drawing air from outside, which would have dust, radioactive particles, and things like that, into the house. So really important to close all of those blinds. Um, also, it just you know kind of gives the house a whole goth motif. You know, someone's going to like come rotting. No one wants to mess with goths. They're just too tough. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about one other thing on your list, and we'll do a question. Um, and then Amber has uh, an item that, to grab any special bedding uh, and anything else from her bed that she wants to, uh, to bring in. Uh, we have a lot of the bedding here, and I mentioned we're grabbing a lot of bedding from my camping stuff, but you know, more is always more, and you know, we want to have all that option. So you, know, you grab your own pillow that you're used to, you grab as much of that stuff, that's a trip that she's going to be doing. And uh, what do we have as another question? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. We don't have the ability to broadcast, but we do have the ability to receive radio. It's very important to be able to get communications into this place. And we have three ways of doing that. Well, we got more than that, but three main ways of doing that. Uh, I'll talk about the lame other ways. It's like we have light tubes, and we can tell whether it's day or night. That's it. That's information, I guess. Um, but the, the ways that we have of getting like kind of like broad information. Trevor, are you getting bored? You want to draw? We got the whole box of crayons and everything. Or a book. Um, the ways we have of getting information in is internet, which is what we're you know uh, using right now. I think there's a really good chance that this internet uh, connection that we have in here is going to be completely useless. Uh, if there's any kind of an EMP pulse, that's going to knock it out. If there's any kind of a power uh, failure in any area, that's going to knock knock it out. Uh, you know, there are so many reasons why the internet could go down. So. I'm not planning on the internet being a source of information coming into this place. I put it in because all it cost me was one wire. Just the cost of that one wire got it in here, and it's like it was such a tiny thing to do. Why not try try to do it? Uh, plus, it allows me to do the live stream, so it, and it's already paid for itself. I already paid for itself right there. Um, the other ways that we have of getting information uh, in are shortwave radio, and we have a FM antenna, and both of those antennas are run into here. And I've got a uh, radio which I'll grab. Remind me, we want to show the bellows. Okay. No, I need the, the Faraday bucket. Where's my Faraday bucket? Well, they 
So this is the radio that we have in here. We have a radio in the house. I'll just give you guys a look at that. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get in the shop without hitting me in the face. So this is what we got in here. Uh, this radio on the back, it can uh, take coaxial inputs. Uh, one is a shortwave, one is an FM. And uh, the FM radio uh, antenna is in our house. It's in our greenhouse. It's mounted to the inside ceiling of our greenhouse. Uh, I built it myself. It's a dipole antenna. I've got videos here on my channel if you want to look that up. Or just look up uh, DIY dipole uh, FM antenna uh, um, out of coax cable. Uh, here on YouTube, and I'm sure you can find some great tutorials. You can make a really great FM antenna yourself doing it that way. I created my own, and that comes in here, so it's a really strong FM uh, signal. We also have a shortwave uh, line in here. I, also, I made a video about how to make your own shortwave radio. Essentially, a shortwave radio antenna is just a piece of coaxial wire where you solder a wire to that internal wi uh, wire uh, that goes to the center of the coax, and that wire that you solder to it is just the, uh, that's the antenna. And that is run off into the woods. I've got like 100 feet of it uh, off going into the woods. So we have those two ways of getting information. And why is that important? Like, so, so we can listen to like classic rock and <laughs> whatever. Uh, well, it's important uh, because there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be uh, disseminated. Some of it is going to be helpful. Some of it's going to be total BS. But you want to be able to get access to all the information that you possibly can. One thing is... We're going to come in here because we think that there's, been, you know, some kind of a reason to come in. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to find out if it was a false alarm? We have Geiger counters in here. We have two Geiger counters in here, uh, and we can take meter readings from outside and be like, you know, is it is it safe? <laughs> you know, we don't even have to go outside. We just put them right up to the door because we can read it right to the door. You know, we can find out whether there's radiation here, but. Wouldn't it be nice to know if there was something in some area or if the whole thing was just a false alarm and we can leave here? I, I'd hate to st sit in this area for two weeks and then get out and it's like, oh, you guys, you guys took that seriously? You were in there the whole time. So I would really like to find out. So yeah, FM, shortwave, really easy to set those up uh, on your own. And it's just a great way of getting information because the internet is almost certainly going to go down. Uh, somebody actually has a question for River. Um, um, do you want to answer a question? Does River have anything to say or words of wisdom for all the other kids who might find themselves in their dad's crazy oversized refrigerator for an impromptu sleepover? Yeah. You want to say anything? You could, or you could just whisper in my ear. I don't want to say that. Loud. You want to think about it for a little bit? They were just wondering if you had any advice for other kids. Because not, there's not many kids that have families that have giant refrigerators on the ground. You know, how about you think about that? We can address some other questions. And if you have an answer, we can get to it later. Right. Before we get to another question, I want to talk more about Amber's critical uh, information that uh, she has on her list here. Um, uh, on her list, it says that uh, Amber needs to grab uh, my phone. <laughs> You know, not just so I can like make calls and text people, but the phone is important because that interacts with the uh, the air quality monitor. We'll be checking that in a little bit. So Amber grabs uh, the phone and the air quality monitor, which is usually in the house. Uh, she's going to grab both of those things. She's going to bring those out here because otherwise we're blind. It's like if you don't have a Geiger counter, you're blind to radiation. If we don't have an air quality monitor, uh, I guess you just have to like look at the crazy in everybody's eyes and try to <laughs> figure out how bad the air is. But without without that, you're kind of blind. And uh, Amber's also grabbing my EDC backpack uh, because it just has all sorts of things in there that are redundant. A lot of it's probably redundant, but it's important to um, you know just have as much as you, as you can in case you forget something. And River's got an answer, possibly. Do you want to see if there's any other questions? Okay. Well, it, River's advice to other children is just if this ever happens, just wh whimper in the basement. Oh. In the corner. In the corner. Whimper in uh, the corner. <laughs> River should have his own inspirational uh, YouTube prepping channel. <laughs> um, uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, uh, do some more on how list. many feet from the top of your head to the outside? Good question. Soil Very level. good question. Yeah. Uh, what we have over our heads is we've got somewhere between uh, like between eight and nine inches is the average concrete thickness that we have over our heads. Uh, I wonder if we can just tilt up at it <laughs> while we're talking about it. This is a uh, corrugated. Um, metal pieces that were kind of all assembled together. They kind of tucked together like, um, like um, it's kind of like roofing, that, that 
Spanish style roofing, you know, they're like the terracotta, is that what it's called? I don't know. Uh, they all kind of interlock with each other. On top of this is between eight and nine inches of concrete, and this, these areas here, I guess, are up to 11 because it's about two inches thicker where it comes down around these corners. On top of that, originally, let me get that fixed back up. Uh, on top of that, originally, we had 14 inches of soil put on top of that. It was difficult finding somebody that was willing to uh, uh, create this box for us. Uh, the, the concrete uh, person that did our house, I was talking to them about my idea that I wanted to do a root cellar, and I was very careful to always call it and only call it a root cellar while we were going through the whole process with them. Uh, although once some of them saw it, they were like, you built a bunker. Uh, but uh, they were a little nervous about how much weight uh, the, the top uh, of this thing could hold up. So they wanted to go kind of easy on it. So we put 14 inches of dirt on top. And the thing with concrete is it gets stronger with time. The, you know, the longer it is uh, existing, it's, it's getting stronger and stronger as it's absorbing more uh, carbon dioxide, uh, especially over the first week. So we did 14 inches, uh, and that was initial. And then after that, I brought it up to two feet, and I waited like a good year and a half before I did that. And I intermixed in there, there's all sorts of rocks and boulders and whatever kind of like ugly bits of stone that I could find around here, I was, I was throwing in there. We went into the woods, you know, if you, if you go around the woods here in New England, there's like rusty bumpers and license plates and old buckets and everything like that. All right, so we're, we're still working on this. And um, we took every bit of scrap metal we could and we just kind of uh, put it over the whole top of us, especially in the area over the bunk beds, because that's where we're going to spend like a third of our day is in that area. Uh, so like over there, I was putting like the majority of like the really dense kind of stuff. River, I don't want you to fall down and break your neck. Um, another bit of shielding I just, you know, this is kind of related is, uh, you know, you see that the bulk bunk beds have three levels here. Um, who do you think is going to be the safest person of all of those? Obviously, the bottom, because whoever's on the bottom has two human shields above them to block some of the radiation. Whoever's in the middle has one human shield above them. So, you know, the, the, the deeper you get in here, you know, the more shielding you get. And if you're going to be setting up something on your own, you can use all types of things as shielding, like just stuff like, uh, you know, cans of food or whatever. If you're, uh, you know, storing a bunch of cans of food, or water. Uh, we mentioned earlier that water isn't necessarily the best uh, radiation blocker, but it blocks more than air. So if you're storing supplies, try to think about where you're going to store those to try to get some kind of a benefit. You'll notice this wall here, it kind of blocks the, uh, the beds from you know the, the, the other end where there's a little bit less shielding over there. So whenever possible, we were trying to use our assets to try to um, you know just create more shielding for ourselves. And if you you're uh, confused about how much shielding something has, you're, it kind of almost just comes down to the weight of it. The heavier the thing is, the more shielding it's, it's offering you because it's got more stuff in there. It's got more atoms. The more dense, the heavier the thing is, uh, the more protection it's going to offer you. I missed what you said, but uh, somebody's saying here concrete, they're questioning, concrete gets stronger over time? I don't think so, man. Uh, I think concrete and water dance gets weaker over time. Okay, okay. Um, we're talking about different time scales. Uh, as if you're talking about decades and decades, yeah, yeah. It, when it was brand new, it was really strong, and then over time, yeah, it's going to start to degrade. But what I'm talking about is uh, like over the first week or so, um, uh, as the concrete cures, it gets stronger and stronger in the first couple days. And if you ever work with concrete, you'll know like if you let it cure like just overnight, and then you go the next day, you can kind of scrape into it. It's like it's hard, but it's not uh, totally rock yet. And then you go another couple of days and it gets even harder. You go a week, it gets even harder. And I believe it keeps doing that up until a couple of months where it just gets uh, stronger and stronger and stronger. But yeah, obviously, yeah. Well, maybe not obviously uh, based on the way that I said it. But yeah, um, once you get past, you know, those months, it'll, it'll start weakening over time. But well, I was talking about that first kind of several months period. People didn't want to bury this thing when it was only a couple of weeks old because, you know, they were concerned about... Uh, the load-bearing uh, capacity of the whole thing. And that's actually one of the reasons that we have this dimension here. I believe we're like seven or eight feet wide, and people didn't want to make a span bigger than that. Um, so if we were going to make this bigger, we would have made it a longer tube or kind of have it like kind of a maze. We wouldn't want to have any spans bigger than eight feet unless we have like columns in the middle. Do we have some other questions, or I should uh, finish up your list? Uh, two questions right here. Um, do you 
Do you think maybe we should put lead flashing in strategic places like on the door and under the bed mattress? Yeah. Um, lead is kind of the the poster child for radiation shielding. It's like if you want something really uh, well uh, shielded, I'm just checking the levels again. If you want something really well shielded, you want to go with lead. Um, but lead, lead has you know problems. You know, one is it's toxic. So if you're working a lot with it, if you're getting dust and stuff like that, I mean, you may be giving yourself lead poisoning by trying to protect yourself from something else. I want to give people an update uh, before we go on. Our CO2 is dipped into uh, healthy levels, finally. It, it took a little while, but we're starting to come down on CO2. Um, uh, and lead is also um, kind of expensive. Uh, you know, if you're buying a, you know, a lot of lead to shield an area, it's it's pricey to get it. Uh, it, it costs a lot to ship it, the, the stuff around. Um, so I, the, I bought the lead that I had to try to make like the smallest package that I could, like to make like a helmet for myself or like a, like a crotch guard. <laughs> or whatever with the lead you know so it's as close to my person as possible because the bigger it is the, the larger an area around you um, one sixteenth inch of lead is going to give you the same protection whether it's right up next to your skin or whether it is you know like three feet from you it's still gonna reduce things by the same amount but if the leads three feet from you you need a much bigger piece of it <clears throat> in order to do the same amount of shielding so you know with with lead yeah if you got a lot of it that'd be great but um, I've tried to use it in kind of a, a piecemeal way just because it's not something that is incredibly cheap and, uh, you know, I'm just trying to use it where, uh, you know, to its best benefit. But yeah, yeah, if you, if you got tons of lead kicking around, uh, yeah, why not? Uh, one more question. I think this is actually asked a second time because we missed it. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Could you, could you put a sand point well in when you dug your foundation of your shelter for fresh water or is it not deep enough? A uh, sand pit for uh, like a, a well? It says sand point well. I don't know. Okay, sure well that's some kind of a well. Yeah, that would have been really cool. In fact, I wish I had a well in my greenhouse as well. Um, that would have, That's a great idea. I, we just didn't do it. Uh, you know, it uh, I did a whole series uh, on building this house. Uh, if you ever plan on really doing your own and you don't mind being bored a little bit, I would highly suggest checking out the series out. It's not meant to be entertaining. It's meant to give you a real sense of what it's like to bite off a project like this because uh, when you when you, you embark on building your, your own structure, your own giant refrigerator underground and everything like that, you have the idea that you daydream, you know, in the months uh, leading up to it but that sometimes you know when the rubber meets the road you know there's just there's other pressures on you and sometimes you cut you cut corners and uh, while I would have loved to have had a lot more wells uh, all around like I'd love to have like I said a well in our greenhouse so we can just go out to the greenhouse and have a hand pump well it'd be great to have a well in here um, you know it just in the hustle bustle of getting things together and just wanting to you know, get everything put together, it, especially we were doing a lot of this build during the pandemic and people just weren't showing up and materials were in short supply and everything. It was one of those things where we did the best that we could, but yeah, that'd be a great idea, having a well point right in here. Awesome idea. If you do it yourself, go for it. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more of yours before we do another question. Uh, another thing that Amber is doing is uh, getting some food. She's grabbing uh, any kind of snacks and things like that. And um, uh, we even note what kind of a bag she should use. We have grocery bags, uh, canvas grocery bags. We keep them in the greenhouse. And there's a reminder here where the grocery bags are. Run over and grab those uh, to, to just kind of fill up any extra things. Uh, yeah, because, we, we got like basic food in here, yeah. but it might be nice to grab like extra snack food so you're not just like having the boring same, uh, yeah. you know, canned foods all the time. We also have ha Halloween candy in here. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we, do have, we do have some variety in here, but... Uh, yeah, why not just kind of any kind of a last minute thing. And, uh, and we also uh, have on Amber's list to grab the radio from our kitchen. We have this radio that I was mentioning that gets FM and the uh, shortwave. And we keep this in here, uh, but we have a better radio that's in the kitchen uh, that also does all those things. It's, um, it's, it's just a higher quality radio. And it's on her list to grab that radio. And I've got the, the way I have that um, hooked up is it has coaxial uh, inputs, but I got adapters so that the kind of coaxial inputs you can just slide right out. You don't have to unscrew them. So you can just she can just slide them out of the wall, take the whole thing with her, and bring it out. And I think this, do you want to do a question or your last thing? Uh, there, there aren't any 
questions it seems if somebody says uh when the marauders say trick or treat first of all <laughs> I, well i guess if they play by the rules you, you, you gotta give them candy <laughs> Uh, and I don't, I don't want their tricks. Um, okay, uh, Amber has another item on her list, and it's kind of related to the one about closing all the blinds, and this is to close all the interior doors. And the reason for that is kind of the same reason, is that the more you can compartmentalize the house and make it so air doesn't move as easily through the house, the less of that stack effect that we're gonna get in our house. Now our house, uh, you know, if you've been watching my channel, you might be familiar with how it was built. It has a huge central uh, vertical area that goes three stories straight up from all the way from the walkout basement all the way up to, I guess, what would technically be the second floor. Um, you know, it, it's a bit of a challenge to not have stack effect happening in there. But the more you can do, the better. And she's going to be closing all the interior doors. And you'll notice that this is almost at the very end of her list. Uh, during the video where I talked about how I was doing my walkthrough of the house and grabbing everything, I talked about how I only turn off the electricity at the end, because I, if it's at night, I don't want to be turning off the lights on people and, you know, everyone's trying to get out of the lights and I'm like, too bad, I, I, my, my, uh, <laughs> turning off the breakers is first on my list. So, you know, that's at the end of this list and her closing the doors is at the end of her list, so she's not closing doors and then other people are opening doors. Um, and then, uh, what did she got here? Uh, just filling and moving her special tub of any of her stuff out here and then once she gets out here she takes those light jugs and she starts filling them with water with whatever pressure that we have left in the house and whatever uh, you know electricity that we still have so we can try to get water and that's the end of Amber's list. Do we have uh, any other questions that popped up? Um, I'm going to check our levels again. This was asked about earlier but uh, looking at my list it got me thinking about it again. Um, you know, we gotta take care of our basic waste stuff, but what would we do if, you know, shit hits the fan, we come out here and it happens to be, you know, my time of the month, how do we handle, like, the, the blood and stuff? Right, right, yeah. Well, um, that, should I answer that or should you? Um. I can answer part of it. I'm not entirely sure how to go about handling it. I feel like we do it, like, a similar way to, like, the other way. It goes in bags, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've uh, done what I can to just kind of support Amber in that. I've, we have all the materials out here that she would normally use. Uh, we have tw twice as much, so we can, uh, you know, you know, just have overkill. Yeah, twice as much as anyone would imagine she might need. And um, beyond that, I guess just hope that they, you know, time it better, you know, have some courtesy and start their war at the right time of the month instead of the wrong time of the month. I've got an update on our CO2. We've been running this for about an hour, and we've gone from uh, about 1,600 parts per billion, I'm sorry, parts per million, 1,600 parts per million CO2, which is too much. And right now we are down to the mid 600s. So we have come down by 1,000 parts per million over the, uh, the past hour. That's running the fan at its full capacity. Uh, but that's pretty encouraging to me uh, because that means to me that we that's a precipitous drop. It's really uh, taking it down, and um, we, it, it says to me we could run this fan at a much lower uh, amount, and we would still we'd still be okay. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. The radon hasn't really come down much, but the, ra the radon I'm not really that worried about because if you've ever met, re measured radon in your house, it's kind of a sluggish measurement. Uh, it kind of averages it over time. I'm not really concerned about that. But the fact, here's VOCs, that illustrates, you see how it spikes up at the end and then shoots right down. That means we're, we're getting fresh air in here. So, so that is good. And here, the CO2, it's lingering a little bit, but you see how it's spiked up and it's coming back down. So that, I, I'm feeling pretty good about our air. Now this air is being provided courtesy of electricity from our house. We also have the ability to get it from the backup system here if that fails. Now what I want to show you guys is the bellows system. This is the manual system that I created. I'm not actually going to hook it up here, uh, not because I don't plan on testing it, but I just, I, with you all sitting uh, on my desk, I have, to, I have to get rid of my desk in order to actually do the pumping, so I can't do it during the live stream, but I will pull it out and I'll demo it for you and I'll explain uh, the parts that I would not be doing. So this is 
the bellows. I built this myself. It's just a box um, with three quarter inch board and um, uh, it's like quarter inch plywood. And it has this lever connected to one of these lawn trash bags, uh, like uh, lawn debris bags like you use for leaves. Uh, they, it accordions open and close. And the way that it works is it just draws air in like that and then blows air out. Is this yeah, it's got these little check valves on the side. This is the outgoing one, so when I push it, that one will blow and open up. And you can see it kind of actually here. I can bring it a little closer. It's kind of awkward. Here we go. You can see it opening up. And here's the other side. This is the draw side. This will open when I open up the bellows. Like that. So every single time, that I pull this handle here, I'm drawing in that much air. I mean, that's, I'm gonna guess that's maybe, I don't know, two or three uh, cubic feet of air, and two or three new cubic feet of air into the shelter, and two or three more cubic feet, and two or three more cubic feet. Um, so I have, a, I have a pretty good sense that this is going to be able to keep up with the other fan, uh, just in terms of you know how quickly we can do the uh, the air exchange, and you know if it came down to it, we could all huddle around the output of this with our faces. And uh, actually, we can demo on on Amber. Uh, okay. okay. I'm just gonna aim this directly at your face. All right. Okay. Like they're gonna need to see your hair. Okay. Here we go. That's cold. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's enough. Okay. So that, that is our plan. And the way that that works is uh, uh, the way that the uh, air comes in, it comes in through a little fan. I've got this piece that goes on the fan and adapts it to, uh, to get into our box. And the box attaches to the wall. There's a little bracket on the wall that this thing just slides right into. And uh, that's, our, that's our ultimate backup. I would really find it Oh God, I hope I wouldn't have to do that for days and days. There's three of us so we can take turns. And it, it's very little, there's li very little effort. It's, to, I mean, I can, I can like pinky finger this and it automatically opens itself up and pinky finger it back. So it's, it's very, very low effort to do it. But you can do it with one arm, you can do it with the other arm. You can kind of go back and forth. You can take turns with other people. I, I think that we could make it do, uh, you know, what we, what we would have to do, you know, take, you know, we do shifts for sleeping or whatever. Uh, but that, that's our ultimate backup plan. You know, is it ideal? Absolutely not. That's a nightmare. But, uh, you know, it's not as bad as suffocating to death. And I will be doing a, uh, I will be doing a test of that. I just can't do it during the live stream because I, I got to get rid of the desk in order to do that. Do we have any other questions, Amber? Because uh, otherwise I feel like we've proven, we've got proof of concept on the, on the air exchange. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were able to really sharply take it down. Does the dehumidifier have a HEPA filter to cope with any flu cold germ thingies? I know the main intake has one, but it's not much use if the germs are in there with you. Gosh, I, I don't... I mean, if one of us is sick, I think we're all sick anyway. Yeah, yeah it is a pretty small space. Yeah. We do have respirators in here. We have N95 respirators. Um, we've been using those whenever... Uh, well, since COVID started, uh, nobody has gotten sick. Uh, it just you know, since we've been using respirators during cold and flu season, you know, we, it's not like we wear them like during the summer or anything like that. But during cold and flu season, I'm just still throwing them on, and nobody's been sick, so they seem to work really well. Um, so we've got those in here. I, I hadn't put them in here specifically with that in mind. I mean, gosh, in such an enclosed space, I think if one person gets sick, everybody gets sick. But I mean, that's about the best that we could do. We have them in here, uh, you know, as a, a backup. Uh, respirator if someone needs to go outside we've got some actually people might you you might be interested in seeing these i haven't shown you these yet where are they here we go actually there's a there's a lot of stuff that uh, is in here that we haven't gone over yet anyone that wants to stick around we're going to get into a lot of the things that we brought in here all right what we have in here are 
uh, respirator masks. Now these can uh, take different types of cartridges and I've got lots of backup, uh, different types. Uh, the primaries that we have, which are like the most expensive ones, and I only have one for each of us, one gas, one respirator mask for each of us, one of these really nice filters for each of us, are uh, uh, these uh, CBRN filters. And I, uh, I bought these from Canadian Prepper from his store because I want to support, you know, the, uh, the community. And uh, the CBRN filters are specifically made for uh, chemical, biological, radiation, something, one of the other letters stands for something else. Uh, but those are the primary filters. But we also have backup filters. These are P100 filters, which will also go on there. And I've got something else that I think a lot of people might not think of. And I want to share that with you guys. In a moment, I'm just going to put this, this respirator away. This is something I think a lot of people might not consider, but uh, it might be a good idea. And it wasn't that much expense. These are uh, glasses that block out all of the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, I I gotten them related to um, you know the, the, the COVID situation because we were doing a lot of uh, UVC light sterilization. Uh, we still do that to our groceries. I think that's probably not necessary, but it's so easy to do. And I think I'm convinced it might make our produce last longer. Sterilizing everything before we bring it into the house, so you buy it at the grocery store, throw it in the sterilizer. I, I feel like I mean it can't not help to, to sterilize things so like mold spores and stuff get destroyed. Um, we, we've still been doing that, and I, I got these related to that, but uh, if there ever was a major nuclear exchange, uh, the, uh, you know, I don't, I don't exactly remember the science of it, but things can happen to the sky where it strips away the ability of the sky to filter out ultraviolet light, and a lot of really damaging ultraviolet light could get down, uh, you know, to our level, and I've got these if I need to go out so I don't go blind. This might be overkill. Again, this is one of those things where, you know, it was an easy enough thing to procure. But, uh, you know, I grabbed those so that I'd have some level of protection from, uh, you know, from UV light if I have to go out. Um, let's see if there's uh, any other questions. And otherwise, I think it'd be good to kind of go through some of the other things that we have in here because we really haven't talked much about our stories. something in the chat and didn't go through. Um, well, why don't you just say it out loud? Oh, uh, someone was talking about how, uh, you know, if I have to deal with my period or whatever, uh, maybe a good idea is having a menstrual cup and, like, dumping it out into the sinks and get rid of the blood that way. And that's actually not a bad idea. I do own a menstrual cup and it's very handy, very easy for me to so we should get a backup. Yeah, we should probably buy a backup just in case. I'm doing my own list here of all the things uh, of all the things that we th think of during this uh, during this uh, test <laughs> run. Alicia, you make a good point. Someone was saying that a menstrual cup the situation sounds kind of laborious, but. Uh, that's more of a conversation for the girls because you know we have that's our body we use the, we actually use the menstrual cup so we would know better than men how well it would work <laughs> yeah i'm not going to enter into that one. it sounds good <laughs> but, uh, i want to talk about the toolbox what i have in here um earlier i needed to use a wrench uh to to get the uh, the cap off of the air intake so I'm glad that I have that, it's already paid off. I've got a standard screwdriver in there. I've got another screwdriver handle that has multiple ends that has uh, you know, standard and Phillips. I've got some, some Allen wrenches because those might, uh, sometimes those are involved in anything electrical. I've got some small size uh, screwdrivers in here and I have some shears. Now why do I have shears? It seems a little bit weird. I specifically have the shears. Remember I said they had the lead uh, sheeting? And if I want to make like some kind of a suit of armor with the lead, if I'm going to go out, I want to be able to cut the lead off, not just have it all in one sheet. So I have the, the shears in here so I can kind of make do and, and do whatever I, I need to do with that, uh, with these guys. Any other questions? I'm going to get more stuff to share everything that we have in here. seeing any 
questions at the moment. Oh, right. Um, sorry, I almost forgot about that. Someone was asking uh, what kind of Geiger counters do we have and you know how much can we actually trust them? Okay. Um, yes, that's a very good question. In fact, that's what I just brought out here. This is my mini Faraday box. It's my hangry lunch box uh, that I've turned into a Faraday box by uh, covering every single seam on it with aluminum tape. Copper tape is a little bit better, but it's more expensive, and the aluminum tape from the test that I've seen uh, is pretty darn effective. So I've, I've got aluminum tape all over this. I, you know, I'm not going to open it up just because it's so well sealed. It's so beautifully sealed. But I'll tell you what's in here. I've got two Geiger counters. One is a lab Geiger counter with a, the, uh, the sensor hole on the back. And um, that's the one that I've had for the longest time. I used that after Fukushima when uh, the government was telling us that there was not enough radiation in the water to be measurable and all that, and it's all safe. I decided to find out on my own, so I was taking seafood that I was buying after Fukushima, and sure enough, you could see the radiation level go up, and then it, it came back down. So it's kind of, as far as I know at the moment, it's back down to where it was before, although I heard they were going to be releasing more, so I might want to uh, you know, start doing those tests again. I've got that Geiger counter in here. Uh, that one I just got serviced about a year ago before we put it in here, because they can be damaged, and uh, you know they can't have issues, so I wanted to make sure that it was as... Uh, in as good a quality as it could possibly be before it went in the box. And then I have another one. It's I, th I think it's a dosimeter uh, that I have in here. And that is, um, I'll put links to these in the description later on if you guys are interested in them. That was a lot more cost effective and it's more of a basic one. It just kind of... It kind of gets ambient levels uh, around you. And, you know, with prepping, two is one and one is none, so I wanted to make sure that I had uh, two of those. And I, I also have AA batteries, AAA batteries, everything that they need in here. I have the manuals for them, and I have um, chargers for the batteries, uh, so I can keep charging those up. Well, what else we have in here? We've got uh, manuals for, uh, you know, the radio, because it's got a lot of functions I'm not familiar with. We've got backup coaxial cables. We've got extension cords if we need to kind of run things to make it more convenient in here. Multiples of those, we've got power strips. And this is something that I think is kind of important. That it's the kind of thing you kick yourself if you didn't have. Uh, and that's in this bag here. And these are all roadmaps. Roadmaps of the entire United States. If we're getting information about, uh, you know, things that have happened around the world, or not around the world necessarily, but like around the United States, and we're trying to figure out, well, you know, there was a detonation in this city that I've never heard about in, you know, some state, or why I get, I'll give myself credit that I know at least all the 50 states, but if it's a city I, I haven't heard about, I'd probably want to know where that is to get a sense like, well, geez, if that's in the northern part of the state, I might be in trouble, but if it's in the southern part of the state, I'm probably fine. So I, I wanted to make sure I had paper maps so as we're listening, we can make notes about where things are happening in different areas. We can write right on the paper maps. Um, I thought that was a really critical thing so that you could interpret the information that you're getting because just getting information is meaningless unless you can interpret it and figure out what it means to you. So we have some paper maps in there. Do we have any other questions? Uh, so people were asking about what's going to happen with the chickens. Could we potentially bring them in here? And I forget what exactly you're saying, but uh, you're saying it's hard to actually keep them in here since it's such a small and close space. It would be a nightmare. I think it would just be a nightmare. I, well, for so many reasons. I, um, I'm mostly vegetarian. I eat very little animals. As I've gotten a little bit older, I've added a few more animals because it feels like my body requires it more than it did when I was younger. So I've added some more animals uh, to my diet, but I try to keep that as minimal as possible because they are lives and I don't take that lightly, the what, idea that What does that have to do with our chickens, though? Well, because the cruelty I'm about to talk about, I think, needs to be in the context of the, I, that I don't take the idea of just cutting the chickens loose lightly, but I, I don't see any reasonable way that we could bring them in here. Um, the issues we would have is they'd be constantly defecating all over the floor. You know, the, the, the coop is like horrible it's messy they'd be flying up everywhere they'd be pooping we'd be, there'd be ammonia everywhere be, they'd be, be more screaming of a waste. yeah it'd be more of a waste concern it'd be you know, a waste we're, concern we're, we're talking about you know our own waste having to add to like the 
chickens just pooping all over the yeah, place. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it would be a nightmare. And on top of that, uh, you know, we've we've added there's some wood in here now. Uh, you know, there's some bo cardboard boxes. There's you know some of this stuff that cuts down on the echo in here. It's not that bad now, but uh, imagine the roosters crowing in here. Yeah, we have two roosters. It would be it would be an absolute nightmare uh, to have them in here. And again, like I said, I'm a vegetarian. I don't take the idea of just cutting them loose lightly. I, you know, there are there are pets, as you saw in the video. You know, they're they're not just these machines that give us eggs. You know, we have a relationship with them. They have a relationship with us. But I just don't think that it would work, and it gets back to that that conundrum that preppers always face. You know, it's not the chicken's fault that they didn't prepare. I guess it's our fault that we didn't prepare enough for them. And give me enough time. I am going to be building next summer, if people can hold off on this, and I hope they can. I am going to be building what I, it's kind of like a chicken bunker, where it's going to solve a lot of these problems for them, where they're almost going to have their own space. But I just don't think that they could be in here as much as much as I would love to. Uh, uh, to, you know, protect them in that way. I just don't think that it's it's feasible. So, uh, that's so, my so you were thinking uh, if we had to, we could let them loose in the greenhouse and just dump out a bunch of food yes. for them, have a water trough. And yeah. Hopefully they could survive relatively okay in the greenhouse, so we're at least sort of giving them a chance rather than yeah. just leaving them to completely fend for themselves and probably die. Yeah. And, and, and the issue that they would be having is... And you gotta, you got to consider that radiation, depending on what it is, the radiation that falls in this area, if it were to fall in this area, has a different impact on someone that lives 60 years versus a chicken that lives five. You know, it has more time to destroy a, a human body because we have a lot more years left in us. In the same way I said, like, if anyone's going out, it's going to be me because I have the fewest number of years left. The chickens have even less years than I do. So, you know, their bodies are not going to be necessarily damaged as much as a human body is. And in their, their greenhouse environment, they are somewhat submerged. It's somewhat buried. Uh, they've got a clear view to the sky, and if any radioactive material falls on the roof, it's, you know, it'll be radiating down into that space. But the roof is like 15 feet away. And the way that you reduce radiation is by shielding, by distance, and reducing your duration. Now, the shielding, you know, the roof doesn't offer any shielding. Uh, the duration is, is what it is. But that, it, that getting that distance between the particle, it's kind of like if someone takes a flashlight and shines it right in your face, it's very bright. But if they get 15 feet away, it's not going to be nearly as bad. I mean, depending on the flashlight, it could still be uncomfortable. But nowhere near as much as if it's right on top of you. So they're going to have those kind of protections. And also... I, Everyone always says, and they're right, you know, you want to, like, think of this thing as being like your ark for two weeks. You're in the ark for two weeks, and then you come out. But after a couple of days, and especially with the use of the Geiger counters, we can evaluate, like, you know, what is the actual danger level outside. I'm going to be able to be able to go outside. I'm sorry, I'm stuttering a little bit. I'm talking for too long. I'm going to be able to go outside and do some things. I'll be able to go out and, like, sweep off solar panels if they're dirty. Uh, you know, not on the house the ones that we have, uh, you know, just for the shelter. I'll be able to clean those solar panels off. I'll be able to check on the chickens. I'll be able to give them some water. I'll be able to do a lot of these things. I'll be out in and out quickly. I'll have all the shielding on, but they're not just going to be cut loose for two weeks. I'll be able to go out there, you know, certainly after, you know, a couple of days, five days or something like that, make sure they have, uh, you know, enough water and, um, you know, do the best you can with it. And again, that's what it comes down to. You make the plans that you can. You try to give yourself the tools and the knowledge that you can use. But in the end, you know, you do the best you can with it. Do we have any other questions? Um, we did have levels. a question earlier. Uh, where is it? I feel like I'm losing my voice because I'm yelling over here. Um, yeah. How will you tech? How will you test exterior radiation to know when you can come out? Okay, that's an excellent question because we are going to be getting information over the radio, I'm sure. And let's just throw out a hypothetical. If uh, people responsible for such things had a decision between uh, playing things on the side of making the population panic less or make the population panic more, you know, which side are they going to come out on? You know, a lot of the announcements, I think, this is my personal feeling, are going to be erring towards the side of making people panic less. You know, why do I feel that? I'm going to give you one example, just one example, and I feel like it tells the whole story. Um, COVID starts. It is a coronavirus. A coronavirus is a type of cold. Uh, right out of the gate, the government's 
uh, advice to people about this coronavirus was that we didn't need to worry because this is a cold, this is a coronavirus, for what, the first time ever, that's not airborne, so you don't have to worry about it. Once it became obvious that it was, and there was a shortage on masks, what did the government say? Did they say, you absolutely really need to get a real respirator, otherwise, well, <laughs> what's happened over the past three years is gonna happen? No, they said, no, oh, just throw anything over your mouth. You know, as long as you got some kind of a cloth, it doesn't matter if there's like big gaps up at the top, that's fine, that's totally fine. Government is going to try to reduce people's level of panic, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. It, a lot of danger gets created by panicking people. So I, I'm not criticizing the government for doing that. I'm just saying that's the way that it is. So if this thing were to play out, there's going to be a lot of announcements over the radio that are probably going to tell people it's okay to come out. You know, you can start like doing trash sanitation jobs again. You can start doing farming jobs again because otherwise we're totally screwed if people, you know, keep hiding from all this stuff. You know, there's going to be a lot of announcements that are going to be out telling people, oh, things are fine. It's totally fine. Don't worry about it. You know, the food's totally safe. We get the FDA here in our country right now. I think I talked about this during the other video that, like, you know, at the, at the expense of, you know, people's health is telling people that, like, all these artificial things we put into our food is totally fine. So my sense is that to know what the reality is, you need to determine it on your own. And the way you need to do that is to have a Geiger counter and to know how to use it. That's why I don't do 30 second short videos here on my channel. I mean, someone asks a simple question and it's got this whole like long beginning. So the way that we would do that, um, actually it kind of hinges on the fact that the door is such a lousy radiation shield. I don't have to go outside. <laughs> all I have to do, I mentioned that I'm taking all of these jugs, I'm stacking them up in front of the door. All I need to do is go around the corner, stick the radiation detector on the top of the stack of uh, jugs that I have in front of the door, pointing out into the, um, uh, into the outside. In fact, I probably do both of them uh, just for redundancy, so I, I don't make uh, you know a choice based on like one of them. Uh, you know, you want to like get a sense between the two what the reality is. And uh, you know, I, I let it take a reading probably for like an hour or something like that because uh, you know radiation uh, tends to be one of those things where you get the most accurate reading if you let it sit for a while. Uh, and then I'll make a determination. I'm going to be bringing uh, books and literature in here because I can't keep all this up in my head. Uh, I'm going to be bringing books and literature that will help me to interpret that. Uh, I forget whether I mentioned it already. I think I did Crescent Kearney's book, Nuclear War Survival Skills. Get it, download it, have that uh, as a reference uh, material so you can interpret the information you get. But yeah, I'll just use the, the Geiger counter to figure out what the radiation levels are outside. And then if it's safe, safe to go outside. And safe could mean it's safe to go outside during the day, but we still sleep in here for like months. You know, if we're going to be spending a third of our day you know, unconscious, why not do it in the shelter? Because even once things are safe, uh, you know, it's it'll be, it'll be kind of a slow roll off, so why not kind of be in here? But uh, th that'd be the way I would do it, and keep checking, 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 because as the wind changes direction, who knows? And I'm gonna be listening to the government's guidance because, you know, it's not completely empty, but their agenda is different than our agenda. Their agenda is, you know, unless you, you wanna get into a conspiracy or anything like that, where their, their agenda is to, you know, kill us all. Uh, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Uh, their agenda is the health of the greatest number of people possible. My agenda is the health of the people that are in this room right now. So, uh, you know, the different agendas, so, you know, you can take what they're saying, but you have to interpret it through the lens of coming at it from different perspectives. We got another, it sounded like there was another question. I noticed there was a little bit of back and forth regarding uh, the feminine hygiene products. I guess this is something I can answer since I have more experience. Uh, someone was concerned about, you know, having to dispose of that stuff, how bad it's going to smell. And honestly, yeah, you're right. That kind of stuff does smell bad if you leave it out for a bit. So um, I wouldn't necessarily be using disposable feminine hygiene products. I have a, uh, a menstrual cup that's reusable and I I wash it out you know every time I finish using it or I need to like change it out whatever I just need to wash that and I you might have noticed me get up earlier it was me checking the sink drain and it looks like it's you know the period stuff it's not necessarily that thick or whatever to begin with, but it looks like the drain should be big enough to just wash that all down so we're not necessarily going to have that disgusting blood, whatever, lingering inside the shelter. It should just be flushed out down the drain. Just shove it down there? Yeah. Right. 
here's our CO2 levels. We got our update uh, right there. You can see the spike up, and and then all the way back down to safe. So I, I'm feeling really good about that. That we were able to, the, the way we were able to get the carbon dioxide out of the air is by bringing new air in. So the old air is being expelled somewhere from some of the cracks here and there, and the new air is uh, is making up for it. I'm looking at our temperature, and our temperature reads about 45 degrees. So by running this thing at full capacity, uh, we very easily brought down the CO2. Um, this is a four inch uh, vent fan. I'll put a link in the description below if you want one of these. I love these fans. They're made for like uh, indoor growing situations uh, where you need to have nice control over your indoor uh, growing environment. And um, they're very quiet. They're very energy efficient and they seem very reliable. I've used them for many, many years, like for hours and hours and hours, like days worth of running. I've never had any kind of an issue with them. I'll put a link down in the description below. But I'm feeling like this is a successful test. Of Somebody's curious about what this uh, app thing is. Okay, uh, if you joined just recently, I'll, I'll give a quick refresher, a really quick refresher. Uh, I am using this device, it's called Air Things. It's a, a sensor that picks up multiple things in the air, uh, carbon dioxide, radon, VOCs, all that type of stuff. Uh, and it connects to your phone and it gives you uh, kind of uh, a rolling readout. Here's VOCs there. You can see where I started. I, all this flat line stuff over here is when it was in our regular house. The, the jump up is when I brought it into the shelter and the, that, that precipitous drop is after we started venting. Uh, the air, uh, the fresh air into here. So uh, I actually I already have a link in the description below about that. And uh, I find that the, it, it's a way of making so you're not blind to what's going on. I'd like to uh, just mention Rivers things because uh, someone Okay, had asked, someone has a quick question. Okay, let's do the question, then we're going to talk about Rivers things. Because uh, if you have kids, I think, what would you agree with this? Do you think it's better to participate or do you think it's better if I just did everything? They've made all the decisions. Yeah. Because that way you get to choose what you bring in, right? Yeah. yeah. I've tried to engage River with this so that uh, you know he can feel like he has some choice in it. So what are we doing? Um, me mentioning the, uh, you know, flushing the blood down the drain. Somebody wants to know where that drain actually goes. Okay, good question. Um, when we were building the structure, this relates to the idea is like, just get wet in here when it rains and everything. When you build any structure, uh, what you usually do, hey, I got paper and pencil, my favorite two things. Uh, I'm gonna draw a little sketch here. Uh, what you usually do is you create uh, what is called a perimeter drain. And I've got it right here. This little circle here is a drain. And this is the foundation wall right here. And this is the inside of the structure, and this is the outside of the structure. And this drain runs all the way along the, the whole perimeter down by this this footing here. And uh, above the drain, you got like you know like rocks and gravel, and then on top of that, some kind of like a like a, a sediment barrier. And then this all up here is all is all dirt. And I can't believe that I actually pointed everything correctly because it was all mirror image for me there. <coughs> So we have a perimeter drain all around this thing, and when I decided I wanted to make a drain for the water, I was—I just decided to just tap into it. I, I left a port uh, just under the entrance so that if water ever kind of came in, uh, you know, you open up the door and kind of you know, water gets in, or under any circumstance, there'd be a way for it to get out. So there was a, I think it's like a, a two inch uh, hole there. I just, uh, I ran the drain from the sink uh, through a little rubber hose that goes out through there, through some PVC pipe, and it taps down into the perimeter drain. So it's dumping it into the perimeter drain right over by where that perimeter drain uh, goes out to uh, what's called daylight, a daylight drain, which is a, uh, a slope going down uh, towards, uh, you know, where it dumps to like actually outside because it's kind of a hillside over there. So that's where it all goes. Um, if I were to have it done all over again, would I do it that way? No, because I'm adding moisture to the perimeter drain and that's kind of not, uh, not ideal, um, but, yeah, I think it'll work well enough for two weeks. And, uh, you know, push comes to shove, we just bucket the stuff out the door or whatever. But it, it's a nice convenience for now. And we actually did make it so that the sink doesn't have to only go up to the drain. The sink could also 
go into the bucket. If for some reason the thing clogs up and it's not working, we can just disconnect that stuff, put the bucket underneath, dump it into the, the bucket, and then the bucket can just get thrown out the door whenever we need to. And hopefully, again, you know, during that like 48 hour to five day period at the beginning, you know, the thing will hold together for at least that long. And then after that, it's, it's a less of an issue going in and out because the great thing about radiation, a little sales pitch for uh, radioactive fallout, is that the most dangerous stuff is the most dangerous stuff because it is losing its energy so quickly. It's shooting out all this energy at an incredibly rapid rate, and that makes it dangerous, but it also makes it very short-lived. So the, the most dangerous stuff dies out after the you know the first uh, several hours, the first several days. So uh, it's kind of like a kind of a mixed blessing. It's 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 losing all its energy and it's dangerous while it's losing it, but it makes it so that it gets safer sooner. I'm gonna uh, go through uh, Rivers List, and I think we probably should wrap this up pretty soon. We've been going for about three hours, and the temperature in here still feels good. There no, are some questions still coming. I will. I won't miss any questions. I'll do all your questions, but I don't want to bore y'all. Uh, I'm just surprised we've got 33 people in here, and I see live streams from other channels, and there's like hundreds of people in them, and it's like. I, I think the, the, the most we've ever had is what, what like a dozen number? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is like this is like a, a blockbuster. People around the around the block. So um, I'm psyched that you guys all showed up, and I, I won't skip any questions intentionally, uh, unless we accidentally miss them. And you know, if I miss a question, just um, you can always send me an email, praxisprepper at gmail dot com, um, and I'll, I'll answer any questions that I happen to miss. So. Um, I can't talk for too much longer either. I'm yelling over that fan. Um, okay, first thing on Rivers' list, and then we'll do a question, is uh, Rivers moving his blankets, pillows, and any toys and anything like that from his bed, stuffed animals, anything like that, and then doing a trip out to the shelter. That's his first thing that he has on his list. And it's great if you can engage your kids to uh, kind of have a list, have something to do. Oh, and this is really super important, um, which I, uh, that'll be like your, your hook. I, I won't tell it until after the question. Super important thing I want to mention. I can forget it. What is it? Uh, let's see. Rivers going to get me water from the sink. No one's ever actually drank for any of the water <laughs> here before. It's probably going to taste a little bit like hose. Where was it? I don't mean it that way. I mean like garden hose. It doesn't have to be filled with river. It's probably going to be gross. Okay, one, someone asked if at some point we could pan the camera around, get a better look at the inside of the, the shelter. Yeah. Um, Smell that. Huh? No. I want to flush that a little first. Yeah. It's okay, it's drinkable. The hoses I have running in here, they're especially for RVs. Um, I used to live in a camper while I saved up money to live in my first house. Living in a camper trailer is not as glamorous as movie stars make it out to be, especially in the winter. Um, so these are hoses for potable water, but still it tastes a little bit like hose. Um, I would like to pan the camera around, but I think the best way to, to see uh, the structure is to just do the tour video. Um, the camera's, the, it's, it's a camera attached to my laptop. It's not, it doesn't really move around very well, and uh, I don't think it would work out super uh, effectively to do that. But uh, I'll make a link down in the description below, or, or you can just look it up. I have a full tour, it's like Fallout Shelter full tour video where I walk through and I kind of show you everything that we have going on in here. I think it, it, the only thing that wasn't built at the time of the video is this this handsome uh, tabletop desk that we have here. It's actually kind of neat. I'll, I will pan over to this. I made this, uh, this uh, desk and the whole thing folds up. That's what these chains are for. It folds up and tucks into here, so most of the time this this desk is right up against the wall there, and uh, and you don't uh, you don't have to interact with it. But it's it's here for you know if we needed to live in here for a while, we got some kind of a, a nice surface. So unfortunately, yeah, I, I can't do a pan around here, but it's all in that that uh, full tour video. And if you you'd like to check it out, I really go over everything, not just things inside, the things outside, because uh, so many things outside service what's in here. The air intake vent, we talk about that. The solar panels, we talk about that. You know, everything is covered in that. Do we have some other questions? Um, I can do a more river stuff while you look. Um, yeah. River's next thing is uh, he does a trip to the shelter and then he goes back and he moves all, and I put sensible in uh, big bold letters here, sensible food from the fridge. Uh, I think one of the biggest tragedies if there is a nuclear war is that if we were stuck in here and there was some really awesome leftover 
in the fridge that I really wish that I could have brought in here. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know there'll be tragedies all over the world, and I'm sorry, I'm just, it's, it's dark humor, but it used to it here on my channel. Yeah, I mean, we want to grab anything from the fridge because I would hate the idea that there's like, I don't know, like fresh apples or fresh something in the fridge, and it's like, oh, it's just going to rot in there, and I'd so love to eat that now. So River's job is to go into the fridge and get all that kind of stuff that is kind of perishable and bring it out here so that we have it and it doesn't go bad. Uh, so it gives us more food, gives us more fresh food, and also, you know, avoid spoilage and all that. And then, line very explicit right here, trip out to shelter. And then after that, he moves the broom uh, from our, uh, our front, our back entryway to near the solar panel. So if I ever need to go out, if we don't have power and I need to get power and we might have to like get snow off the solar panels or soot off the solar panels, the broom is literally literally right there. So I'm not exposing myself to radiation, going and finding the broom and bringing it all the way back. I can go right out, the broom's right there, I can clean it off, I can get back in and minimize how much time I am outside. We got a question? Uh, yeah, what would your plans be when you leave the shelter after being in it for two plus weeks? Yeah, that is a wild card. There's all sorts of ways that that could go. I, I guess, you know, everyone has their own feelings about that. Here are my thoughts on it. Um, ideally, we were in the, sh in the shelter and it was pretty much unnecessary. Our area never really got blanketed. It was just a risk of it. You know, it happened someplace else and the fallout all fell out from, in other areas. And we leave this area, we leave the fallout shelter and we kind of go back to our lives as normal and by saying that I mean to, you know we're usually kind of reclusive here anyway and you know we do all our preppery kind of stuff but you know we go back to our life as normal we don't have radiation outside that we have to contend with it was all just a precaution so that if the wind changed or whatever we didn't get blanketed here that's ideal I don't know whether that'll be the case another uh, scenario would be that we did get blanketed with stuff and you know we leave after two weeks and we get some you know questions to uh, to figure out you know we emerge and we start trying to figure out like well what, what actually ended up happening you know what areas got hit what areas are are better than where we are what areas are worse than where we are should we try to move to one of those areas is better temporarily or permanently uh you know uh there are so many you know questions that we would need to ask ourselves uh, in the meantime, what we would be doing is trying to mitigate how much exposure we have to anything that is around us. You know, yeah, we could go out for the day, we can do things in the, in the house because it's warmer, it's more comfortable. We'd probably be sleeping here, and that would make one-third of our day so that we are uh, being protected from any radiation that's ambient. Because you go outside, there's radiation all over the place, any, any, anywhere that you go. If you're an airline pilot, you get, you know, doses of radiation to, to, to the degree where you have to, uh, you know, control that and, you know, not not uh, spend too much time at altitude. There's radiation all around us. Our bodies are um, built for dealing with radiation. That's just part of life. Uh, the idea is you don't want to go above a certain threshold and a certain threshold, I'll just pronounce it correctly once. Um, and this reminds me about the thing I wanted to make sure I didn't forget earlier. This is, a, this is super important. As we were going around with this, uh, one thing I found, I'm just going to throw this in, this is unrelated, uh, and I still have to do this, I'm punching a hole in all of these and I'm making a necklace. So these can be attached to people's necks. The one thing that we did when we did, uh, when we did the run through is people are holding these and they're like, I got to grab this, I'm going to put that down, I'm going to do all this. How likely do you think it's going to be if these get forgotten everywhere and people don't remember where they are? These are all going to turn into necklaces, which brings me to the thing that is relevant right now. There's going to be another thing on that necklace, and that is something that is linked in the description. I'd highly recommend you get uh, one of these uh, you know, as soon as you can. The prices have gone up a little bit, but they're not that sky high yet. They're about 26 bucks each. You can get a dosimeter um, radiation card that will tell you how much radiation you're absorbing. And each one of us is going to have one of these things. And uh, these are going to be attached to the cards so that as we're going around, we would be able to say, you know, we got to call it. Uh, you know, we'd like to do more, but there's too much radiation. we got to head in. But we could also use those cards, you know, later on to get a sense of how much radiation we're being getting exposed to you know, during our lives and, you know, determine how much of our life is going to be outside the shelter, how much is going to be inside the shelter. The longer you go, 
uh, we will be able to do more time out of the shelter. We're going to be continuing, uh, you know, with things like you know iodine or whatever you know seems uh, you know relevant. Uh, getting more information as we go. I'm going to go through some of the medicines that we have here. I'm going to pull out that tub and put it here. I'll go through that in a moment. Uh, Hoople's Cat does a great job of going through that. I highly recommend you check out Hoople's Cat's channel. I think anyone that's subscribed to my channel is already subscribed to his because I'm always a big booster for him. Uh, he, he goes in detail about all the different things that you would want to have ahead of time, not just potassium iodide. It goes way deeper than potassium iodide, and a lot of these things you can get for yourself. Some of them are more expensive, some of them are less expensive, but even if you get some of the ones that are cheaper, that gets you in a better place than if you didn't have any of this stuff. I'd highly recommend it. Someone's leaking. Okay, that's what we do the test. Who's leaking? We got a leak. We got an actual thing going on. All right, let's see what's going on over here. Okay. So we got a puddle under one of these. I think one of these is leaking. When I moved it earlier, we had some water. I think it's under this one. Let me get this out of the way. Okay, so we're forming a little puddle down in there. Let's just get that off to the side. We got a small puddle that is forming under some of the jugs. This is. No, I don't think. I, don't, I think look at this one looking down the side though. Uh, okay, there's a question about Yeah, there's a question about who might be leaking. So what we're gonna do is check that one a little bit. We might have a leaking jug, that's why we do this. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna find out about that. Do you wanna take care of that right now? There's a question that I can answer while you're uh, Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. okay. Um something I wanted to address that I noticed in the chat is uh somebody still concerned about the uh, waste disposal thing and yes I do think that is a very valid concern um, maybe you missed this detail but what I mentioned is that uh, with the feminine products there there won't be any disposable ones there is just going to be like a single reusable menstrual cup that can be rinsed and you know all that stuff can go down the drain rather than being kept in here and you know, posing a potential issue to us, and uh, as Praxis already mentioned, you know, it, it drains outside of the shelter, but if there's an issue with the drainage, we could, like, you know, put in a bucket and toss that out, so, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, the, the waste disposable thing won't be too much of an issue. That is something I'm definitely thinking about, and I, I do hope in practice that you're, uh, that's something we're mindful of, you know, the waste disposal thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. But we do have the disposable ones, too, and we can just bag those as well. Yeah, we do have the disposable ones that we could bag, but I also have the reusable ones so that we don't have that waste just sitting around in here. Yeah, but again, it can just get hucked out the door. Yeah, so, that, can, that yeah. can be hucked out the door even if we do have to yeah. use it. So, yeah, the, the waste disposal thing is definitely something we want to think about. We're not going to just gloss right over it. Yeah. And one thing that we're trying to do is give ourselves options. So we're going to bring lots of different things in here, and we're going to kind of figure it out as we go. In fact, uh, someone, I, I forget your uh, your screen name because it was kind of long, but uh, someone had uh, mentioned the idea that this shelf right here uh, could be rotated to open up the space a little bit. And I really like that idea. I think initially I had kind of uh, put it uh, in this orientation as further radiation block for the, um, for the beds, but the reason I bring this up right now is because um, I've been thinking about maybe moving the shelf, but if we're gonna be stuck in here for weeks, it's not like we're gonna be like just these automatons and whatever whatever things we came up with ahead of time, like that's all we've got and we can't problem solve and we can't come up with other uh, approaches to things while we're in here. We wanna make sure we have as much knowledge and as many tools as we uh, can possibly uh, provide for ourselves in here, but we're going to be doing lots of problem solving. We're going to be doing lots of figuring out once we're in here. Maybe I get tired of this thing being in this orientation while we're stuck in here for two weeks, and that would be a fun project for an afternoon. Take everything off of it and rotate the thing over or whatever. You know, so uh, I think it's important to kind of think about that, that uh, as long as you are providing yourself with the tools that you need to solve problems, 
you're going to be collecting more information later on and you're always better at solving problems when you have better information and that's one thing over the past couple of years with the controversy of um, you know again related to COVID you know should I take this government uh, suggested intervention should I not take this government suggested intervention my uh, feeling on that was to always just kind of hold off and wait and see and get more data in and I feel like that's always a, a great approach to things uh, you know at the far end, that can cause you to procrastinate, and procrastination itself can become an issue. But uh, whenever you can uh, get into the mindset of just gathering more data and then making decisions, when you you have a, bit, a little bit of a better sense, because we're doing this test, but it's not like we can't test everything. We can't test every period and everything. So yeah, that's a hard thing to test. Yeah. So as long as um, as long as uh, you know we have the tools for ourselves, I think we'll be in a good position but we can test uh, the smell of shit this is a bunch of chicken shit in here literally I'm gonna open this up and <laughs> right there well I just I want to make it like maximum awfulness okay so in fact we'll get it in the shot a little <laughs> here in uh, in my my, uh, my career path as a cinematographer we have a, a phrase called mise en scène which is French what? for what's in the shot and uh, I'll just get this little mise-en-scene going, on, going in, uh, on there, and we'll just see uh, how bad it gets. Okay. And uh, if it gets bad, then we just close it up and see how long it takes for it to go away. I, I, I could read a little bit more of Rivers stuff here. Uh, one of these uh, pretty pretty uh, important here. Uh, and do we have any more questions, or are we are we clean? Uh. Well, you can look while I. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we have any. Okay. Well, oh, we, we do. Okay. Someone was wondering if. Uh, well, hold on that. Let me just. Okay. Go. What? Oh, what do you want? You want to get a juice box? River just got thirsty, so we're we're gaming this out. There's juice boxes here. <laughs> you see it? Just pull out one of the juice boxes. Don't damage them all, though. I'll wait until I can have stuff in there. You get it? Okay. All right. And we have way more food in here than we'll ever need. It's a great place just for storing stuff. Okay, so for um, River's List, uh, this is his last thing before he comes out to the shelter. And he has some fish. Now, we mentioned, you know, what we were going to do for the chickens, you know, give them food, give them water, uh, and uh, wish them good luck. Uh, he's got some fish, and, you know, you might say they're just fish, but, you know, they're a pet, and we care about them, and we want to give them the best shot that they can. So what we did in advance is I bought a two-week feeder. You can buy these things for if you're going to go out away on vacation. Um... So we bought a two-week feeder. It's in our pantry. It's ready to go. This is the kind of thing why I, why I think it's great to game these things out in advance. You don't want to like be in Hawaii and find out the ICBMs are coming in and be like, <coughs> I got to get to the pet store and buy a two-week feeder so I can go run home and you know feed my fish. It's good to have this stuff ahead of time. So we have it ahead of time. River grabs a two-week feeder uh, from the pantry and he brings it up. He puts it in for his fish to give them the best chance that they have. Uh, and then he moves in a last books, toys, games, uh, puts them in his special tub, gets his computer tablet, which is right here, that has some more little games and things for him, and then he does his final trip out, and that is the last of these lists, which by the way, are laminated, so they don't get ripped, and I already needed to add something to mine, so I've added some things in Sharpie on mine. And you said there's a question. Um, would we be able to deal with a mouse, bat, or other pest if they somehow got in here? It's food. No, we're it's not food. Gonna, we're not going to eat a mouse or a bat. No, no one's getting in here. You know, it, <laughs> no, nothing bigger than an ant has ever, in 20 years, ever gotten into any structure that I've built. <laughs> ever. Ain't no mouse getting in here. Ants can get in here, but no, no, nothing big can ever get into anything that I built. If you live in a house and you have mice and, and stuff like that coming in, um, that is not necessary at all. Um, I, I don't know why houses are built the way that they are, where like mice in the house are kind of like a normal thing. It is not at all necessary <laughs> for mice to be able to get into a house. You can totally just build your house so that things like that can't get in. Like uh, the, the house that, that we have, there's like a little overhang where the exterior sheathing kind of extends over the foundation a little bit. And I just took some one eighth inch mesh and put it up in there and put some spray foam that's like a pest blocking spray foam to hold it in place. It's not at all necessary for, for 
pests like mice to be able to get into houses. Um, I don't know why builders don't build them so mice can't get in. It's not. I am. I'm a photographer. And I figured it out on my first house how to prevent mice from getting in. So yeah, I mean that's that's not gonna happen. Again, that's why I don't just 30 second shorts for my channel. I can't just say it's. I just can't say it's not gonna happen. Anything else? This isn't bad. I smell it a little bit. <laughs> but I'm not smelling it much. Somebody asked, do you guys have a few Frito-Lays variety packs of chips to keep you from going crazy in the shelter? We do have some junk food. Let me talk a little bit about the food that we have here, okay? All right. Yeah, it's nice to have like more treat sort of things rather than all just like basic survival yeah. foods and then like, getting bored of like eating the same thing over and over. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reach up over you guys, give you a nice crotch shot here. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna bring down the fan. We don't need it anywhere near that high, and this is a lot uh, less yelly. I'm gonna go over all the food that I have here. Let's uh, kind of do a bit of a pan like that, okay. like that, like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna run over. It's not all like rice and beans and health food in here, not at all. We do have um, baked beans. I chose baked beans because they're really easy to warm up. We didn't talk about cooking. We're gonna talk about cooking after this. Um, they're really, really easy to, to heat up. You just have to open them up. Have a can opener if you. <laughs> If you uh, put yourself in a situation like this, have a can opener, or I mean, you can open these up with a knife. It's um, kind of dangerous to do it that way, so it's ideal like yeah, to yeah. have a can opener. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if it slips, you can cut yourself, um, and it, you know it's just messier. But yeah, yeah, get get yourself a can opener. We do have a can opener in here. It's in our kitchen bucket. We've got baked beans here. The entire bottom is all canned fruit. It's like uh, it's all this kind of stuff on the bottom. Um, the reason for that isn't because I thought it'd be great to start like a diarrhea party as soon as we get in here. Um, it's just way overdose on, on fruit. The reason it's in here is because, I mean, this is legit also a uh, root cellar and this is where I store all of our fruit, but we are never gonna feel like we're missing out on um, canned fruit. Uh, it's a nice thing to have that. Um, well, I, we're not actually gonna use these, but again, just because this is literally being used as a root cellar, these are our, our squash that we grew this year. Um, and those are sitting in here. We got garlic. Again, I don't think we're going to be really eating that. It's just taking up space. I'm going to cut around this corner and I'm going to bring some uh, samples of the things that we have here. Because you want variety. You want to shake it up. Uh, here is some rice packs that we got. This is a uh, rice peel off. And what I did is I vacuum sealed this stuff. So this could be in here for a long time and these aren't going to go bad. Because these kind of pa these kind of boxes, they're just in a... Uh, it's just a cardboard box. It's not like there's a foil wrapper or anything like that. So I got a desiccant pack in here, and I've got what is it? Uh, six, six boxes per uh, vacuum seal pack. So I've got two of these over there. I mean that's that's good. that's a, a lot of rice right there. On top of that, we've got this backup stuff. Here's just plain rice that's just in a, a you know glass jug. This is dehyd uh, dehydrated vegetables. These used to be really, really cheap until the last couple of years, and these really went up in price. That's one of the great things about being a prepper. You get, you get everything when it's on sale, if you're smart, and you save a ton of money. Right, what else do we have in here? Um, I know that just plain rice without any flavoring is great and all, but bullion cubes. And I put the bullion cubes in a Mylar bag with a desiccant because those are something that you get, they'll sweat if you get uh, too humid. Are you having fun right there? Also, speaking of uh, you know, food that is you know, not necessarily health food, we've got ramen noodles. I mean, that's a pick-me-up. Nice warm food that doesn't have to be cooked to use. <laughs> we've got a bunch of penne pasta and marinara sauce. So, I mean, that's, gonna, that's good calories, and the marinara sauce is... Uh, is uh, this one's drip on here? We got a little bit of a drip on this one. I, I think something above is leaking. Why don't we do the test? Let's find out. <laughs> Doing the dry run so we can test what's working, what's not working. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, we also have. Uh, here we go. We've also got some cans of. Uh, you know, seltzer and soda and things. Specifically, we've got, yeah, these are sticky. I'm not sure what's up with that. 
There's some stickiness on there. I'll wash my hands at the sink. Um, specifically, we've got ginger, uh, ginger ale, uh, because if people are suffering from radiation sickness, and again, we are going to get to the medicine and all the cooking implements, if people are suck suffering from radiation sickness, having some ginger ale can help with nausea a lot. All right. We've got these packets. We could use more or a little bit. Uh, we've got these packets of cheese macaroni. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of protein and some more calories. My knee keeps coming up to the camera. Okay. Because I'm looking at what Bill is saying. Yeah, we've got sprouting seeds. Remember I said we were going to bring sprout, uh, sprouts uh, starters in. So we've got sprouting seeds. We've got five pounds. We could live in here for a year with that. Uh, for some vitamins and electrolytes, we have Gatorade. I never really drink Gatorade under any normal circumstance. I consider it an emergency thing. But we have it in here. Uh, protein powders. That's a great way of just getting protein very simply. We've got a bunch of these. Right, what is it, Reverend? Uh, not too much longer. Why don't you just play a video game? Do you like doing that? Uh, some cereal? For fun? No, no, do it now. You can do it close. All right, what else we got here? Did you count it? We're fine. All right. Uh, this is dried mango, dried fruit. I think it's good. You know, we've got plenty of fresh fruit. I think we'd probably go through the fresh fruit first. But we've got dried fruit. Uh, somebody asked if you have powdered milk in here. I, I own powdered milk. I don't know whether it made out. Yes, actually, we are. Uh, the powdered milk isn't in here right now. The powdered milk is going to be brought in here um, with our camping supplies. Uh, all right, my camping supplies are kind of interchangeable with my bug out supplies. So if we ever needed to to bug out from the house, all we got to do is take my camping stuff and throw it all in the car. And because of that, I have some extra things that I don't really use camping, like dehydrated milk. But we'd be fine even without the dehydrated milk. It just gives us another another option. We have a bunch of granola bars. I can grab these from this side, so I don't keep cut, cutting around. A lot of boxes of granola bars uh, there. We've got a whole junk food bag. I'm not going to go through all the junk food. But we've got, it's just like old Halloween candy and all different things. There's gummy bears in there. There's all sorts of things in there. Let's see, what else have we got? Uh, we got pretzels. I mean, that's an easy thing. There is uh, peanut butter up here. We got, I'm not going to pull out the pistachios. We've got pistachio nuts. You know, just different ways of getting protein into that's you. peanut butter? Oh, I, I, was, I was talking about both. Peanut oh, butter okay. and pistachio nuts. I'm sorry about that. All right, um, and then... That covers all the basic food um, on the far back shelf. I'm not going to pull them out, but we've got a lot of um, soy milks and almond milks. I never really got into the shelf-stable uh, cow milk. Uh, I, don't, I just don't tend to use that that much. We do have a little shelf-stable cow milk there, but mostly shelf-stable uh, soy milk, shelf-stable almond milk, the kind of stuff in the Tetra Packs. I'm, Tetra Packs are really useful. They make stuff last forever and ever and ever. I've used milk like six years past expiration date, and it was fine. It could probably go longer than that. Uh, that doesn't guarantee you won't have a problem with it, but I'm saying from my own personal experience, I've done that, and it's been totally fine. Tetra Packs are great, but they can't be recycled at all. Uh, that's the downside. But in today's world, nobody recycles anything anyway because the economy's collapsing. So it kind of doesn't matter whether you're using Tetra Packs or uh, you know, something uh, you know, more eco-friendly anyway. We've got some liquid Gatorade over here, a bunch of juice boxes that you saw me tap with River. And uh, now what I want to do is I want to bring Somebody, out... Somebody's curious if you have like a selection of teas in here. I, oh, they know me well. Yeah, I've got tea. I just didn't mention it. I got like boxes and boxes of tea. Yeah. Somewhere up in here. I forget. It's a bunch of Newman's tea in there somewhere. I didn't even go into all of it. What you really got to do is think about the things that you eat. I mean... It, this is kind of the stuff that we tend to eat oftentimes, except like, not the Gatorade. But uh, you know, think about your diet. Think about the things that you can buy in advance. And if you're buying things on sale, you know, you can throw them, uh, you know, back, and that makes it so that anything that you're eating, you're always getting everything on sale. Every every uh, meal that we eat is primarily made out of food that are on sale, uh, and we save so so much money being into prepping and preparedness because we're. We stock up when it's cheap, and you know we, uh, you know, we are able to ride out all the uh, the spikes and the bumps. I'm going to get the cooking materials, but first I want to wash this stuff off my hand. I really, I, I, I'm not entirely satisfied that I know where that came from. I got to game that out a little bit later. Um, I'm getting cooking supplies first. Really. Right, so here are some things 
that we have related to cooking. River, you can play on your tablet. You're always asking to play. Play, play now. Yeah, yeah, we got a sponge. Okay. You okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we've got a pot for cooking things and a lid that kind of fits on there. I got this, this like, you know, those transfer stations where people are getting rid of their trash and there's like giveaway stuff. We got that from there. It's a really nice pot. And this is, I didn't know you could buy this. This is a uh, fire extinguisher in a spray can. It's like that. I've never seen anything like that before. So we have that uh, for in here. Obviously, if we could smother the fire using another method, that would be preferable because you don't want to be, I mean, if we implemented this, this is going to create all sorts of things in the air that we're not going to want. Um, but I guess we've got respirators, <laughs> so we can, we can go to those. But I mean, if the alternative is that you die in fire, uh, which one would you choose? What? Would you, would you rather die in fire or, uh, you know, hold? Uh, you know, use it and just try to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So we got the respirators if we weren't able to clear the air as fast as we'd like. But I thought that was kind of interesting. It's like a little uh, fire extinguishing spray can. We've got uh, small bowls and plates. These are all, it's all, it's kind of glassware. Um, I guess plastic might have been nice, but I was able to find that. This is what we got for cooking. I'm gonna pull this up. Oh, I don't know if you can aim down at this a little bit. The cord's kind of wrapped around some things. Let's put the whole thing up closer. All right, so this is what we've got for cooking. It's just a hot plate. It uses about 800 watts. I have tested it out, and it can run off of, well, it can certainly run off of our whole house system. And it uh, was able to run off, well, we still had sun, it was able to run off of our small backup system as well. So we are able to cook that way. We have, uh, let me get it. okay, it's just a, a serving spoon. So uh, we can use uh, that for cooking either way but as you notice with a lot of the foods quite a number of them they can be eaten without cooking and you know the rice you'd have to cook but you know even the baked beans you know you can eat cold baked beans it's not my favorite pick I know some people prefer it that way I don't but we are able to survive without being able to cook anything so these are just um, um, benefits so uh, we've got cups and bowls and plates and we've got uh, utensils forks and spoons and you want to be able to clean stuff so we've got the sponge, so we can clean stuff, wash it out in the sink, and uh, you know, uh, keep reusing stuff that way. So that is our cooking stuff. Uh, do we have any questions? Otherwise, uh, somebody is suggesting maybe we should have fire blankets. I've been thinking about a fire blanket. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about that. We're right, we're right, right in the way we're in. We got fire, and um, in that table that you're on, River, it's it's strong enough to hold computers. There's still a pot out. Oh yeah, that's why there was so much, there's a lot of stuff out. Right, well, I'll just grab this. Yeah, I wasn't putting my weight on it. Okay, yeah, just don't, just don't put your weight on it. I wasn't. It's made for computers, not for people. Okay, so I'm pouring out right now the, uh, the bin of all the medications. And again, I would highly recommend you go to Poople's Cat's channel if you want to get uh, more information on everything that I've got in here. But, uh, you know, since I've I've got it right here. I might as well kind of run through it with you. I'm not going to get into the why of any of this stuff because it is not my area of expertise. Again, I'd recommend you check out Hoople's Cat for that. Some of this I'll talk about just a little bit, but most of the stuff, it's, it's above my pay grade. And because of that, I printed out... No, wait a sec. That's a scrap paper. paper. That's a scrap paper side. I printed out instructions for what all this stuff is for, how to use it, dosages and everything. Again, this is something that I was uh, hooked up with through Hoople's Cat's channel. He linked to this document. And that's really important. You need to have the tools, you need to have the medications, but you also need to know what's the proper dosage, how long should I take it for. So you really want to print that stuff out. Don't trust yourself, if you're me, to remember it because you'll let yourself down because I forget everything if I have a chance to. Um, so let's, let's dive in here, okay? Um, starting with the, the kind of the basic stuff. This is like where people uh, usually start. This is potassium iodide. This is the kind of official stuff. I bought this years ago. Uh, I don't have any concern that it's gone bad. Potassium iodide is essentially just a salt. And as long as it's, it's not getting wet and being washed away, and this is all in foil packets, um, you know, it's going to be just fine. Uh, this is Iosat. Uh, there's also thyroid safe. Uh, the reason you take this is you've got a thyroid gland up in your neck, 
and it is really hungry for iodine, and it will drink up radioactive iodine if it's in fallout, uh, especially if the beginning of one of these events. So you want to saturate. Uh, it's like a cork for your uh, your thyroid, and you want to fill it up. I've got tons of these. These things, I there's probably like five hundred dollars worth by today's prices. I didn't pay five hundred bucks for this. I bought this stuff from a prepper back before it was expensive. Um, but we've got tons of it. Um, if we somehow go through all that, we've got backups. Uh, this is, I actually bought this kind of recently. This is just a nutritional supplement, potassium iodide. Uh, each one of these is 130 milligram, um, yeah, milligrams. And, uh, okay. yeah, those. Um, and, the, and these are, you know, they're pretty much an equivalent. I mean, this, the Iosat stuff is kind of like the gold standard, and I would, I would definitely use that first. But this stuff, it, potassium iodide, it's potassium iodide, unless this company that I bought it from is like a charlatan company, and they're like, you know, someone's just like shitting in the <laughs> bottles and being like, here's your potassium iodide. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, unless it's like a scam or something like that, potassium iodide, potassium iodide. Um, and it's it's a it's a proper dosage. So we've got that, and each one of these has um, uh, 140 tablets in each. So that's like um, 10 weeks worth. I can't do the math in my head. It's a, it, this is years worth of potassium iodide. Let's say we run out of potassium iodide, and um, you know we actually have more in the house too. Um, We've got uh, other types of iodine. Uh, this is called, uh, I think, Lugol's solution. Do not quote me on that. <laughs> uh, that was recommended by uh, Nurse Bones and Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy on their channel. Uh, Lugol's solution is kind of a backup. It, and this gets into what was mentioned earlier. If we have people that come here, maybe I don't want to give them my potassium iodide pills, but maybe I can share some Lugol's solution with them. Um, and time. What's that? Someone is suggesting we should check the air. Oh yeah, you, know, you want to check it? Sure. Yeah, because we did we reduced it. We'll see if it start ticking up or if it's still flatlining. Um, so that's all like the iodine related stuff in there. Um, that is just about all that I can comment on, except for apple pectin. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, the first person that introduced me to this idea was uh, Brad from Full Spectrum Survival, and he tends to do his research pretty well on things. Apple pectin, I guess, there's a lot of research that it bonds with um, crap radioactive crap that you don't want in your body and helps to flush it through. Um, so I bought a bunch of apple pectin. Worst case scenario, I take this and I didn't need it. I mean, it's not like, it's just apple pectin. So, you know, you're, you're taking this, you're not going to be like poisoning yourself or anything like that. So we've got plenty of apple pectin. We're still coming down on CO2. CO2 is the one I'm watching. That's the one I want. Let's see what we've come down to. Oh yeah, we're still going down. So we have the fan turned down to just about half its capacity, and it's still, we're still, we're flat wide. We're like indoor house levels in here. In fact, there's less CO2 than there was in our house. So we could turn that down even more. Do you want to do that? Or I'll, I'll do it. Give you guys another crotch shot. <laughs> right. Someone's asking about uh, bug out bags, if that's something we would want to grab from the house and bring it here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, buy EDC pack, which is, do you think you can carry it, River? Yeah. Uh, that is uh, one of the things that Amber actually grabs. And here it is here. Thank you. And this is what I use for my EDC pack. Um, I, I consider, I, I think more about EDC than I do about bug out. Um, but when you live in a place like we live, uh, you, have to, you have to have bug out on your radar. Like if there's a wildfire, we're not going to like stay here. Um, but m under most circumstances, we would want to bug in here. So this is like my get home bag. And uh, this definitely comes in because it has so many different tools on, uh, that are in here. So like anything that I might forget, you know, I've, I've either got backups or something like that in here. So that definitely comes in because uh, it has all those different tools. Okay, I'm going to dive into this just a little bit. And again, Hoople's Cat, if you want to know the why of a lot of this stuff. Um, this is Tums. Uh, it's not for like indigestion or whatever. Uh, this has uh, calcium, what type of calcium in it? I don't, I, I don't know offhand, and I don't think I need to say it. It has some type of calcium in here, which is beneficial, allegedly, for bonding with certain, radio, I'm just going to call it all radioactive crap. Uh, and this uh, allegedly uh, can help move it out of your system. From people that are much smarter than myself, uh, they have done the research, and that is there. Suggestion, calcium phosphate, a different type of calcium that, uh, again, bonds with radioactive crap. Try to move it out of your system. 
Uh, this is, this one was a little bit more expensive. This is Prussian blue. Prussian blue, uh, it's a tint that is used in chemistry. I wonder if it's also used in paint, like Bob Ross paint, oh. oil colors. Um, it's a common uh, uh, material that you can find in chemistry labs. And again, I'm just going to say it bonds to radioactive crap and it gets it out of your, your system. Uh, we have barium sulfate right here. Again, bonding with radioactive crap, moving it out of your system. Some of these things uh, can cause um, constipation and stuff. So if you're taking one medica medication, it's kind of the way America is. It's like people are so highly medicated, they're taking one medication to counteract the effects, or the side effects of another medication, which is there to counteract the side effects of some other medication. So if you ever need to take some of this stuff, constipation is one potential issue. And I think that this, or indigestion, I, I'm not even sure, and, and to be honest, this one's all in French anyway. This is Gaviscon. This is another thing that was recommended to me by Hoople's Cat, and he's a smart guy, so I listened to him. Uh, we have that, and again, I don't need to have all this in my brain because it's all down on the paper right there. What else do we got? Also related to not getting constipated, Metamucil. We've got that in here so that we could keep things moving through uh, people's bodies. And we've got more, more fruit pectin here just as a powdered form. We could add this to like a drink or whatnot. I've never had, drank fruit pectin directly. I don't know what it tastes like. Is it fruity? I'm not sure. Never had it. Okay, now speaking of getting constipated, here's here's the uh, elephant in the room. This is calcium ben, uh, bentonite clay. People use this as a dietary supplement. I have never messed with this myself. This is something allegedly that can just, it's like a plunger that'll just push stuff through your system, bond to things, and move it all out. I, I think th this was a... Uh, Are you sure that's something we can consume? It says mix it with aqua water. Yeah, yeah, well, it's... it's it, <laughs> take your chances when you get uh, information from me. Uh, I I did my research on it at the time, and I felt comfortable with it. I I, I don't remember all of it. Uh, I just trust the former, my former self that I did my research and, uh, and, and trusted other people that are much smarter than I am. So that is what I have. And that's, uh, that's a pretty extensive uh, collection of things. Uh, but, you know, if you're not going to do all of it, just doing some of it uh, puts you in a situation. No, I'm not leaving stuff out this time, am I? No. Uh, just doing some of it is going to put you in a better situation than if you have none of it. If you were going to do only, you know, one of those things, I mean, uh, you got to get yourself the, the potassium iodine. It is, uh, I'm sorry, potassium iodide. You need to get yourself that because that is just such low-hanging fruit. It's so cheap to get that stuff now, and it's going to pro easily protect you from a very specific uh, thing that will happen to you if you uh, if you don't protect yourself in that way. Um, in terms of the rest of it, uh, you know, a lot a lot of the other stuff is pretty cheap. You know, the, the calcium uh, types of stuff, the tons. That's all pretty cheap. Um, you know, the pectin is all pretty cheap. So a lot of this stuff is pretty inexpensive. And even if you just get some of it, then you're better off than having none of it. Do we get any more questions? I think we're starting to wrap up. This chicken crap here does not, it's not really problematic. And it's open. This is something by the medical bin. It's some heating, uh, foot heating pads that we have in case we wanted to get toasty toes. You know, during the day we have plenty of electricity. That's the thing with sun. Uh, you often have to have plenty of heat and, uh, or plenty of electricity and you, uh, you're you looking for things to do with it. Do we have a first aid kit in here? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's also been some people asking about how we're gonna deal with like cabin fever. Yeah, what makes you think people might get cabin fever? <laughs> River being you, stir crazy right now. Yeah, do you feel like you're uh, going stir crazy? Yeah, we can let you out. I mean, I think we. How here, long have we been in here already? We've been in here. We've been in here long enough. I'm just answering questions at this point. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think we could let River back to yeah. the house. Do you want to leave? Headache and, and it's fine. Okay, do you want to leave? Okay, uh, I'm going to crack. Uh, what was the last question? Uh, cabin oh, yeah, it's about cabin fever. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, 
I, I guess uh, you know the, the the games and things like that. I think you you, you wouldn't want to leave if you knew you'd be out in the radiation there. Right? No, I don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, rivers being allowed back into the house because we've done our dry run for probably long enough. I'm not entirely sure how we would deal with the uh, cabin fever if uh, River does end up getting stir crazy if the real thing happened, but I guess we'll try to make do. It, it's probably better to deal with cabin fever yeah. than dying of radiation or whatever. <laughs> yeah. We just flash on. Yeah, it's dark out now. <laughs> we came in, it was daytime. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why we have... Oh, well, you know what? We got this. Yeah, this, this is actually something else we have in here. We have uh, this uh, charge-up lantern. And we have another... Actually, we have a, a, a third uh, electrical backup system. There you go. And we'll just charge it. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be in soon enough. Actually, we do have to wrap this up because we've got dinner time. I've got some fresh bread that we're going to be baking in our oven because we're crazy preppers and we have an oven right over our wood stove. Um, but let's wrap up with the last couple things and um, I'll go through the first aid. Somebody somebody commented experiment failed, but it's okay. It's just a test. But uh, our original plan was just to try it out for a few hours just to monitor the air quality. That was the point of this test. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think it's possible to keep... A, kid totally happy for <laughs> days in an environment like that. I think you just got to suck it up. I, you know, we've done yeah. what we can. I, I, I'll i take any suggestions about things that we can do that will make it more entertaining. But uh, well, in fact, River, this is going to be good for you. Because I mean, this is why we do these tests, is because all the things you're thinking you want to get back to in the house, yeah. we should make provi provisions for having those things here. Because I, uh, I uh, well, the thing is are you a little nervous about going out because it's dark? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Would you mind escorting him? Uh, yeah, I could, but well, I I'll wanted to help him. with questions. I'll escort him. Uh, There's one of us. I can escort. Okay. Him, I guess because I figured this is your live stream. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I think you guys probably <laughs> prefer to listen to Amber, but all right. So I mean, you're the one who has more answers. Yeah. <laughs> but uh. All right. Here we are. Okay. So the question was. Uh, about our um, our first aid. Now, uh, the the nice thing about bringing the EDC bag is that I uh, you know I have a, a first aid kit in there with an awful lot of supplies like tweezers and you know all, all different types of medication, uh, you know bandages, um, you know all the basic things that, that uh, come up. And I've worked on that EDC bag for years. Uh, you know, it's kind of like like a mommy bag to, to some degree, or like a dad bag. You know, all the th types of things that come up when you have kids out. Um, you know, I've been refining that, and I feel like it's a pretty good mix at this point. But we've got extra stuff in here, so let's see what is the extra stuff that we have in here. First off, I mentioned this. We've got some respirators, so we just got backups of the respirators. You know, like uh, someone brought up the idea that there could be a. Um, uh, what are, you, are you looking for shoes, Amber? Uh, no, I have my shoes. I'm just putting my stuff back in my box. Okay. Are you coming back later, or are you staying out? Uh, I could come back. Do you want me to? I don't mind. Yeah, okay. I think you guys would appreciate it, right? <laughs> write, 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 uh, write responses in all caps if you want Amber to come back. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, yo, so we, we've got those. Uh, we've got Q-tips. That's way more Q-tips than I need in here. I just happened to grab the entire bag. Um, I could probably use one of these right now, Ricola cough drops. I should probably maybe do an extra pack of those. I think we're going to be in here for a while. By the way, Ricola cough drops, they've had some, I've noticed shrinkflation on these. They used to have 50 drops in them, now they're down to 45. Uh, I'm noticing with the new ones that I buy. We've got bandages in here. This is also filled with uh, vitamins. Uh, that's an important thing. I didn't mention that earlier. Vitamins. Uh, we've got like... Um, uh, like cold, like kind of nighttime syrup, but I think that stuff's mostly uh, effective at just knocking you out with the alcohol that's in there. Uh, this is my buprofen in here, aspirin, which is not for kids, uh, but for the adults. Acetaminophen here. Uh, we've got um, uh, lip balm. You know, if your lips are dried and cracked, that can be really irritating. So we've got that in here. I tend to have issues with uh, athlete's foot, so I've got some athlete's foot cream in here. Uh, whenever my feet get cold in the winter, they respond by sweating, and uh, it doesn't work out great when they're in boots. So I was figuring, you know, this might be an environment where if it's kind of cool, I might have that issue, so I brought that in there. Any kind of issues that you have that are on kind of an ongoing basis might be a good idea 
to get things. Um, this is, uh, you know, for a vaginal yeast infection. We have that in here just in case. Uh, you know, more vitamins and things of that nature. So that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that we have in, in there. I, I'm, I've got a little bit more in my, uh, my EDC pack uh, for that, uh, you know, more uh, traumatic stuff like tourniquets and, and things of that nature. But I'm basically just kind of keeping it to the types of things that I tend to use on an ongoing basis. Oh, yeah, so someone said, yes, come back. Okay, I'm going to get some water here, and now I've got to double duty it. I don't think, unless you guys have any uh, big uh, extra questions, I think we're we're pretty much set here. I'm going to do one more check. Yeah, our, our air quality continues to improve. I feel really good about the, uh, the test of this. This thing is running at one-third capacity, and it's having no trouble keeping it nice and clean in here. Let's, I'm just going to read what we've got here, so... Um, David Stowe suggests a little whiskey. I actually have whiskey in the house, and I, I bought a whole case of it. I don't, I don't drink any of that stuff recreationally. I bought it as like a way of knocking yourself out, um, you know, again for, uh, um, you know, with a cold or something like that. And I just haven't had one where I've needed it. I've got like a whole case of whiskey in the house. Um, okay, more more uh, drivers saying don't leave us. She'll be back. Um, someone, uh, Brash Achilles. This is a brilliant idea. Nobody has done this. Real world stuff and valuable. Gotta go. Oh, okay. So we're just stopping by. Moondog. Uh, I read in Orthodont Orthodontist John Mew's book that the animal in the wild die of tooth decay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I haven't mentioned that. We have toothbrushes somewhere. I got them somewhere. I think they're in with the tampons and everything like that. I've got a whole box. Actually, I'll go through with that right now while Amber's off. I got a whole box of all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the uh, the categorization here is a little questionable. Tampons, pads, etc., and dental. <laughs> oh, yeah, they fit together so well. Um, so Amber does a lot of reuse stuff, like uh, washable things, but uh, I didn't think that we really want to be messing with that in this environment. I guess you can throw them in a bag, but we we. Uh, just have all the disposable kind of pads and liners and things. Uh, we've got, actually, it looks like a clever guy. got even more medicines in here. Ibuprofen, Desitin. Desitin's a good one for rashes. Uh, I just keep packing this thing over and over and over again. Um, but, yeah, we've got toothbrushes, dental floss, toothpaste, all ready to go in here. We have that. Uh, we've got uh, dental rinse in here. Oh, and this is something. Soap. Uh, you know, for washing our hands, we've got a soap dispenser over the sink. Uh, you'll get to see that if you look at the, the total uh, walkthrough. But we got soap uh, for refilling that. I mean, because if you're going to wash yourself, you need to be, have soap for it. All right, um, you want to hop in? I'm going to jibber jabber a little bit. Just look for any last questions. I don't want to leave anyone hanging. And uh, otherwise, I feel like we're, we're pretty good. We've got a lot of toilet paper, a lot of toilet paper. Um, one thing I'm going to miss is we, we've been using a bidet in the house. I'm not going to bring the bidet in here. <laughs> we're just, we're just going to have to deal with uh, you know, uh, wiping our butt with paper like everybody else. we got plenty of toilet paper. Uh, we've got uh, paper towels. Um, that was actually something that was brought up by uh, you know, a viewer. had uh, suggested the idea of like, cleaning up a mess or something like that. And I was like, yeah, you know, that would be a good idea Like have some paper towels. So we got that. Do we have any more questions? Uh, do you have stuff to help people sleep? I can see how it might be a problem if someone is stressed. Hmm. I, I've always just been like a soldier up, you know, kind of <laughs> deal with it. Um, I don't know, what do you feel about that? Um, I like guess melatonin, I think they're talking about. We yeah. could buy it. I just, it's, not, it's not something for me. I, I think it would, you would develop interesting sleep cycles if you were in here. We have uh, light tubes that go to the outside, so we could get some sense of the time, and I'll have a watch on me, so we'll know what the time is. And I think it would be good to kind of keep with the circadian rhythm uh, to some degree. Yeah, it would be But nice. I think we could get some, like, weird jet lag effects, like, mm. after several days of... In general, I have issues with insomnia, so I wonder if, at least for me, that might help. Well, I'll order some. Add that to the list right here. Okay. One thing I want to talk about that relates to that kind of keeping of a circadian rhythm uh, is some lighting that we have. We haven't really talked about these bunks at all. Uh, I'm going to rotate the computer a little, make it more, more bunk-centric. Uh, <laughs> like, 
like that. Now I didn't clean these guys off completely. Uh, we've got these sleeping pads that, uh, I might just duck or something. We have these sleeping pads, one of them for each of the bunks. Uh, all these things are going to be gone if we had to use them. And uh, we've got a power strip on the side here so people can plug in electronic devices if we're laying down in there. I wanted to make these little cubbies very comfortable. And one thing that I did is I've got lights uh, in each of the cubbies. Uh, I'm going to kill the I'm going to kill the room lights here. Okay. So we I'm going to kill this light too just temporarily. <laughs> You know, you can Sorry. see that we can make it have kind of a nighttime feel in here. And I think that that's really important. I think it would create a lot of insomnia kind of feelings uh, if we were in an environment where... Um, that you know, side light that mimics sunrise and sunset to help get good sleep. That's, exactly. That's exactly. interesting. Yeah, and, and that is the uh, cinematographer in me. I'm going to turn the lights back on now so we can see a little bit better. Uh, the cinema, uh, cinematographer in me uh, had a plan for that. And... The, the lights that are generally illuminating the room uh, in here, uh, with the exception of this one, I threw this one in behind the camera uh, because it is, uh, it's just, you know, we can see our faces are a little bit more, better illuminated. But the light in here right now is a, a bluish white light to kind of uh, simulate uh, the daylight uh, that would be outside. Again, this is just fill, uh, you know, to make it so we look a little bit less um, ghoulish uh, for the live stream. The, the, this light wouldn't be on, but for most of the day, it would be kind of the blue light kind of mix. But these lamps here, these are tilted towards the orange, uh, and that has a link towards the circadian rhythm, and, um, you know, main, maintaining that kind of uh, cycle where at the, at the end of the day, you are uh, introducing more orange light to yourself. That's definitely something we do in our house, right? All the lights in the house are all orange. So when we're turning them on at the end of the day, it tr tries to move you in that direction. Uh, you know, if you're on a screen or something, it doesn't it doesn't help you very much. But um, but yeah, that's definitely something that we've done here. It's like daylight, we will use the blue lights. Evening, we'll use the orange lights and try to uh, you know do what we can to try to get around that potential. Anything else? Otherwise, I think we probably should call it. I, that's I call it success on the shit smell. I call it success on the. Uh, on the carbon dioxide question, um, I feel like we are we're doing well. Do we have any any questions? Uh, I mean, we, we've got a list for ourselves. Things we want to improve. Maybe get melatonin. Someone suggests maybe we should have a broom in here in case there's like broken glass or anything like that. That's a really good idea. Thank you. Who said that? Um, you got a gold star. <laughs> Alicia. Oh, Alicia. Oh, good luck. I would expect no less. Okay, yeah. I've been thinking about maybe getting a dustpan just for cleaning up, but um, you brought it from the level of being a want to a need. Because, yeah, if you break glass, that's a problem. Dustpan. So any other questions, or are we good? Let's see. How do you heat the place? Okay, yeah. Um, I didn't even show them. Um, I do have some heaters. Uh, is it worth getting them out? No, it's a pain in the ass. I'm not going to get them. I bought some heaters. Uh, they're just little plug-in heaters that, uh, you know, are for like a, like a space heater kind of thing. And we could do that, but I don't know how much we would. Maybe during the daytime if we have plenty of electricity and everything's functioning. We are back up to 46 degrees. So we're, we're going up, and I think the longer we're in here, we're going to be warming up the space more and more. We're cooking, we're warming up the space more and more. I notice it's been getting cooler in here as it, as, you know, it got dark. Um, I, that's just experiential. Okay. Yeah, no, it, the, the temperature... It just seemed like it got cooler in here as opposed to how it was when we first came in. Yeah, no, it actually gets, it's warmer. It got slightly warmer since we first came in. When we first came in, it was 43, and now we're at 46. Um, so we are kind of slowly ticking up. Actually, I'll just, this is tangential, but that's one of the great things about the root cell is it's very thermally stable. Like, all winter, it, like, you, it never goes below freezing in here. It's a very thermally stable environment. Um, yeah, we're fine. Our, our, our CO2 levels are great. We're good. This is a successful test. I'm glad we did it. We learned a lot. I hope you guys learned something. And if you do have any extra questions, you can shoot them over to me at praxisprepper at gmail.com or just jump in on any of the videos that I you know, routinely publish. You can ask me questions off topic. I could be doing a video about like 
shit eating and, and tea bagging during <laughs> the po- apocalypse, and you could bring up uh, something, uh, you know, some question about this. I'm always happy to answer questions. That is the main reason that I do this channel is to try to share information with you guys. It certainly ain't for the revenue that, that I get from YouTube. I get like a dollar a day for my my whole channel, and I I feel like I put in more than like five minutes a day worth of work, which is what uh, would be like minimum wage or whatever. So um, that's it. Thank you for very much for joining. I don't have a classy outro uh, to share with you guys. Or actually, maybe I do. My friend uh, Ryan from Prescott Caliber Club. I'll go out on his outro uh, to give us an, an opportunity to show our end tags and everything like that. But again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your ideas. And uh, if this is something you want to do, it does not have to be to this degree. Anything you do is better than nothing. So start thinking, start brainstorming. If you got a basement, you can build something like this in a corner of your basement. Check out my Lego video about doing just that. Lego Fallout Shelter. You can uh, Google it. I'm probably the only person that's uh, uh, made a video like that, so you'll probably find me. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal. Can you guys, uh, I think you guys can still hear me, can't you? <laughs> okay. I can just answer questions here.